This is tape one of three tapes on the New Order of Barbarians, referred to on these tapes as simply the New World System. Tapes one and two are reminiscence by Dr. Lawrence Dunnigan of a speech given on March 20th, 1969, by an insider of the order, whose names and credentials are given in the interview with Dr. Dunnigan on tape three. The moderator for these tapes is Randy Engel, National Director, U.S. Coalition for Life. There has been much written and much said by some people who have looked at all the changes that have occurred in American society in the past 20 years or so, and who have looked then retrospectively to earlier history of the United States and indeed of the world, and come to the conclusion that there is a, that there is a conspiracy of sorts <clears throat> which influences, indeed controls, major historical events not only in the United States, but around the world. This conspiratorial interpretation of history is based on people making observations from the outside, gathering evidence, and coming to the conclusion that from the outside they see a conspiracy. Their evidence and conclusion are based on evidence gathered in retrospect, period. I want to now describe what I heard from a speaker in 1969, which in several weeks will now be 20 years ago. The speaker did not speak in terms of retrospect, but rather predicting changes that would be brought about in the future. The speaker was not looking from the outside in, thinking that he saw conspiracy rather he was on the inside, admitting that indeed there was an organized power, force, group of men who wielded enough influence to determine major events involving countries around the world. And he predicted, or uh, rather expounded on uh, changes that were planned for the remainder of this century. As you listen, if you can recall the situation, at least in the United States in 1969 and the few years thereafter, and then recall the kinds of changes which have occurred between then and now, almost 20 years later, I believe you'll be impressed with the degree to which the things that were planned to be brought about have already been accomplished. Some of the things that uh, were discussed uh, were not intended to be accomplished yet by 1988, uh, but are intended to be accomplished uh, before the end of this century. There is a timetable, and uh, it was during this uh, session that uh, that some of the elements of the timetable were brought out. Uh, anyone who recalls early uh, in the days of the Kennedy presidency, uh, the Kennedy campaign, when he spoke of progress in the decade of the 60s, that was kind of a cliche in those days, the decade of the 60s. Well, by 1969, our speaker was talking about the decade of the 70s, the decade of the 80s, and the decade of the 90s. So that uh, I think that terminology, that way of looking and looking at things and expressing things, probably uh, all comes from the same source. Prior to that time, I don't remember anybody saying the decade of the 40s and the decade of the 50s. So I think this uh, overall plan and timetable uh, had taken important shape with more predictability to those who control it uh, sometime in the late 50s. That's speculation on my part. In any event, the speaker said that 
his purpose was to tell us about changes which would be brought about in the next uh, 30 years or so so that an entirely new worldwide system would be in operation before the turn of the century. As he put it, uh, we plan to enter the 21st century with a running start. He said as we listened to what he was about to present, he said, some of you will think I'm talking about communism. Well, what I'm talking about is much bigger than communism. Um, at that time, he indicated there is much more cooperation between East and West than most people realize. In his introductory remarks, he commented that uh, he was free to speak at this time. He would not have been able to say what he was about to say even a few years earlier, but he was free to speak at this time because now, and I'm quoting here, Everything is in place, and nobody can stop us now. That's the end of that quotation. He went on to say that most people don't understand how governments operate, and even people in high positions in governments, including our own, don't really understand how and where decisions are made. He went on to say that... Um, he went on to say that the people who really influence decisions are names that, for the most part, would be familiar to most of us, but he would not use individuals' names or names of any specific organizations, but that if he did, most of the people would be names that were recognized by most uh, of his audience. He went on to say that they were not primarily people in public office, but uh, people of prominence who were primarily known in their uh, private occupations or private positions. The speaker was a doctor of medicine, a former professor at a large Eastern University, and he was addressing a group of doctors of medicine, about 80 in number. Uh, his name would not be widely recognized by anybody likely to hear this, and so there's no point in giving his name. The only purpose in recording this is that uh, it may give a perspective to those who hear it regarding the changes which have already been uh, accomplished in the past 20 years or so, and a bit of a preview to what at least some people are planning for the remainder of this century so that we or they would enter the 21st century with a flying start. Some of us may not enter that century. His purpose in telling our group about these changes that were to be brought about uh, was to make it easier for us to adapt to these changes. Indeed, as he quite accurately said, uh, they would be changes that uh, would be very surprising and in some ways uh, difficult for people to accept and he hoped that uh, we as sort of his friends would uh, make the adaptation more easily if we knew somewhat beforehand what uh, what to expect. Somewhere in the introductory remarks he insisted that nobody have a tape recorder and that nobody take notes which for a professor was a very remarkable kind of thing to uh, expect from an audience. Something in his remarks suggested that uh, there could be negative repercussions against him if his, if it became widely known uh, what he was about to say to, to our group, if it became widely known that indeed he had spilled the beans, so to speak. Um, when I first heard that, I thought maybe that was sort of an ego trip, somebody enhancing uh, his own importance, but as the uh, revelations unfolded, I began to understand why he might have had some concern about not having it widely known what was said, although this, although this was a fairly public forum where he was speaking. Remarks were delivered, but nonetheless he asked that uh, 
no notes be taken, no tape recorder be used, uh, suggesting there might be some personal danger to himself uh, if these revelations were uh, widely publicized. Again, as the remarks began to unfold and some of the rather outrageous things that were said at that time, they certainly seemed outrageous, uh, I made it a point to try to remember as much of what he said as I could and during the subsequent weeks and months and years to connect my recollections to simple events around me uh, both to aid my memory for the future in case I wanted to do what I'm doing now, record this, and also to uh, try to maintain a perspective on what would be developing if indeed it followed the predicted pattern, which it has at this point, so that I don't forget to uh, include it later. I'll just include some statements that were made from time to time throughout the presentation. Um, just having a general bearing on the, the whole presentation. One of the statements was having to do with change. Uh, people get used, the statement was, people will have to get used to the idea of change. So used to change that uh, they'll be expecting change. Nothing will be permanent. This often came out in the context of a society of, uh, where, where people seem to have no roots or, or moorings, uh, but would be passively willing to accept change simply because that was all they had ever known. This was sort of in contrast to uh, generations of people up until this time where certain things you expect to be and remain in place uh, as reference points for your life. So change was to be brought about, change was to be anticipated and expected and accepted, no questions asked. Another comment that was made uh, from time to time during the presentation was, people are too trusting. People don't ask the right questions. Sometimes being too trusting was equated with being too dumb. <coughs> but sometimes when, when he would say that and say people don't ask the right questions, uh, it was almost with a sense of regret as if he were uneasy with what uh, he was a part of and wished that uh, people would challenge it and uh, maybe not be so trusting. Another comment that was repeated from time to time uh, this particularly in relation to changing laws and customs and uh, specific changes. He, he said, everything has two purposes. One is the ostensible purpose, which will make it acceptable to people. And second is the real purpose, uh, which would further the goals of establishing the new system and having it. Frequently, he would say, there's no other way. There's just no other way. This seemed to uh, come as a, sort of an apology, uh, particularly when at the conclusion of uh, describing some particularly offensive changes, for example, uh, the promotion of drug addiction, which we'll get into shortly. He was very active with population control groups, the population control movement, and population control was really the entry point into specifics following the introduction. Uh, he said the population is growing too fast. Numbers uh, of people living at any one time on the planet must be limited or we will run out of space to live. We will outgrow our food supply and we will overpollute the world with our waste. People won't be allowed to have babies just because they want to or because they are careless. Most families would be limited to two. Some people would be allowed only one, and the outstanding person or persons might be selected uh, and allowed to have three, but most people would allow to have uh, only two babies. That's because the zero population growth uh, is 2.1 children per completed family, so something like every tenth family might be allowed the privilege of the third baby. 
to me, up to this point, the word population control uh, primarily connoted uh, limiting the number of babies to be born. But uh, this remark about what people would be allowed and then what followed made it quite clear that when you hear population control, that means more than just controlling births. It means control of every endeavor of, an enti of the entire world population. Uh, a much broader meaning to that term than I had uh, ever attached to it before hearing this. As you listen and reflect back on uh, some of the things you hear, you will begin to uh, recognize how one aspect dovetails with other aspects in terms of controlling human endeavors. Well, from population control, a natural next step then was sex. Uh, he said sex must be separated from reproduction. Sex is too pleasurable and the urges are too strong to expect people to give it up. Chemicals in food and in the water supply to reduce the sex drive are not practical. The strategy then would be not to diminish sex activity, but to increase sex activity but in such a way that people won't be having babies. And the first consideration then uh, here was contraception. Contraception would be uh, very strongly encouraged, uh, and it would be connected so closely in people's minds with sex that they would automatically think contraception when they were thinking or preparing for sex. And contraceptives would be made universally available. Nobody wanting contraception would be uh, find that they were unavailable. Contraceptives would be displayed uh, much more prominently in drugstores and right up with the uh, cigarettes and the chewing gum out in the open rather than hidden under the counter where people would have to ask for them and maybe be embarrassed. This kind of openness was a way of uh, suggesting that uh, contraceptions are Contraceptives are just as much part of life as uh, any other item sold in the store. And contraceptives would be advertised. And contraceptives would be dispensed in the schools in association with sex education. The sex education was to get kids interested early, uh, making the connection between sex and the need for contraception early in their lives, even before they became very active. At this point, I was recalling some of my teachers, particularly in high school, and found it totally unbelievable to think of them agreeing to, much less participating in distributing contraceptives to students. But uh, that only reflected my lack of understanding of how these people operate. That was before the school-based clinic uh, programs got started. Many, many cities in the United States by this time uh, have already set up school-based clinics which uh, are primarily contraception, birth control, population control clinics. The idea then is that the uh, connection between sex and contraception uh, introduced and reinforced in school would carry over into marriage. Indeed, if uh, young people when they matured decided to get married, uh, marriage itself would be uh, diminished in importance. Uh, and he indicated some recognition that most people probably would want to be married, but that uh, this certainly would not be any longer considered to be necessary uh, for sexual activity. No surprise then that the next item was abortion. And this, now back in 1969, four years before Roe v. Wade, uh, he said abortion will no longer be a crime. Uh, abortion would be accepted as normal and would be paid for by taxes for people who could not pay for their own abortions. Contraceptives would be made available by tax money so that uh, nobody would have to do without contraceptives. If school sex programs would lead to more pregnancies in children, that was really seen as no problem. Uh, parents who think they are opposed to abortion on moral or religious grounds will change their minds when it is their own child who is pregnant. So this will help overcome opposition to abortion. Before long, only a few diehards will still refuse to see abortion as acceptable, and they won't matter anymore.
homosexuality also was to be encouraged. Uh, people will be given permission to be homosexuals. That's the way it was stated. They won't have to hide it. And elderly people will be encouraged to continue uh, to have active sex lives uh, into their very old ages as long as they can. Uh, everyone will be given permission to have sex, to enjoy however they want. Anything goes. This is the way it was put. <coughs> And I remember thinking uh, how arrogant for this individual or whoever he represents to feel that they can give or withhold permission for people to do things. But those, that was the terminology that was used. In this regard, uh, clothing was mentioned. Clothing styles would be made more stimulating and provocative. Recall uh, back in 1969 was the time of the, the miniskirt when they were, those miniskirts were very, very high and very revealing. Uh, he said it's not just the amount of skin that is expressed, exposed, that makes clothing sexually seductive, but other more subtle things are often more suggestive. Uh, things like movement and the cut of clothing and the uh, kind of fabric, the positioning of uh, accessories on the clothing. If a woman has an attractive body, why should she not show it, was uh, one of the statements. There uh, was not detail on what was meant by provocative clothing, but uh, since that time, if you watch the changes in clothing styles, uh, blue jeans are cut in a way that they're much more tight-fitting through the crotch. Uh, they form wrinkles. Uh, wrinkles essentially are arrows, uh, lines, which direct one's vision to certain anatomic areas. And this was around the time of the uh, burn your bra activity. Um, he indicated that a lot of women should not go without a bra. They need a bra to be attractive. So instead of banning bras and burning them, uh, bras would come back, but uh, they would be thinner and softer, allowing more natural movement. Um, and uh, it was not specifically stated, but certainly a very thin bra is much more revealing of uh, the nipple and what else is underneath. Uh, than the heavier bras that were in style up to that time. Technology. Uh, earlier he said uh, sex and reproduction would be separated. You would have sex without reproduction and then technology was reproduction without sex. Uh, this would be done in the laboratory. Indicated already much, much research was underway uh, about uh, making babies in the laboratory. There was some elaboration on that, but I don't remember the details, uh, how much of that technology has come to my attention since that time. I don't remember. I don't remember in a way that I can distinguish what was said from what I subsequently have just learned uh, as general medical information. Families. Families would be limited in size. Uh, we already alluded to uh, not being allowed uh, ex more than two children. Divorce would be made easier and more prevalent. Most people who marry will marry more than once. More people will not marry. Unmarried people uh, would stay in hotels and even live together. Uh, that would be very common. Nobody would even ask questions about it. It would be widely accepted as uh, no different from married people being together. More women will work outside the home. More men will be transferred to other cities in their jobs. More men would travel in their work. Therefore, it would be harder for families to stay together. Um, this would tend to uh, make the marriage relationship less stable and therefore tend to make people less willing to have babies. And the extended family would be smaller and more remote. Travel would be easier, less expensive for a while, so that people who did have to travel would uh, feel that they could get back to their families, uh, not that they were abruptly being uh, made remote from their families. But uh, one of the net effects of uh, easier divorce laws, uh, combined with the promotion of travel, and transferring families from one city to another 
was to create instability in the families. Uh, if both husband and wife are working and one partner gets transferred, the other one may not be easily transferred. So one either gives up his or her job and stays behind while the other leaves, or else gives up the job and risks uh, not finding employment in the new location. Rather a diabolical approach to uh, this whole thing. Uh, euthanasia. Everybody has a right to live only so long. The old are no longer useful. They become a burden. You should be ready to accept death. Uh, most people are. An arbitrary age limit could be established. After all, you have a right to only so many steak dinners, and so many orgasms, and so many good pleasures in life. And after you've had enough of them, and you're no longer productive and working and contributing, then you should be ready to step aside uh, for the uh, next generation. Some things that would help people realize that they had lived long enough. He mentioned several of these. I don't remember them all. Here are a few. Uh, the use of very pale printing ink on forms that people were uh, necessary uh, to fill out so that older people wouldn't be able to read the pale ink as easily and would need to go to younger people for help. Automobile traffic patterns. There would be more high-speed uh, traffic lanes, uh, traffic patterns that would older people would, with their slower reflexes would have trouble dealing with. Uh, and thus uh, tend to lose some of their independence. Big item uh, which was elaborated at some length was the cost of medical care would be made burdensomely high. Uh, medical care would be uh, connected very closely with one's work, but also would be made very, very high in cost so that uh, uh, it would simply be unavailable to people beyond a certain time. And unless they had a remarkably rich supporting family, uh, they would just have to do it out care. And uh, the idea was that if uh, everybody sees enough uh, what a burden it is on the young to try to maintain the old people, uh, then the young would become agreeable to helping mom and dad along the way uh, provided that this was done humanely and with dignity. And then the example was uh, there could be like a nice farewell party, a real celebration. Uh, Mom and Dad had done a good job. And then after the party's over, it take the demise pill. The next topic is medicine. Uh, there would be profound changes in the practice of medicine. Overall, medicine would be much more tightly controlled. The observation was made Congress is not going to go along uh, with national health insurance that in 1969 he said is now abundantly uh, evident but it's not necessary we have other ways to control health care uh, these will come about more gradually but all health care delivery would come under tight control uh, medical care would be closely connected to work if you don't work or can't work you won't have access to medical care uh, the days of hospitals giving away free care would gradually wind down until that was virtually non-existent. Costs would be forced up so that people won't be able to afford to go without insurance. People pay. You pay for it, you're entitled to it. It was only subsequently that I began to realize uh, the extent to which you would not be paying for it. Your medical care would be paid for by others, and therefore you would uh, gratefully accept on bended knee what was offered to you as a privilege, uh, your role uh, re being responsible for your own care would be diminished. As an aside here, this is not something that was developed at that time. I uh, didn't understand at the time. But as an aside, the way this works, everybody's made dependent on insurance. And if you don't have insurance and you pay directly, the cost of your care is enormous. The insurance company, however, paying for your care does not pay that same amount. If you are charged, uh, say, $600 for the use of an operating room, the insurance company does not pay $600 on your part. They pay three or $400. Uh, and that differential in billing uh, has the desired effect. It enables the insurance company to pay for that which you could never 
pay for. They get a discount that's unavailable to you. When you see your bill, you're grateful that the insurance company can do that, uh, and in this way you are dependent and virtually required to have insurance. The whole billing is uh, fraudulent. Anyhow, continuing on now, um, <clears throat> access to hospitals would be tightly controlled. Uh, identification will be needed to get into the building. Security in and around hospitals would be established and gradually increased so that uh, nobody without identification could get in or move around inside the building. Theft of hospital equipment, things like typewriters and microscopes and so forth, would be uh, allowed and uh, exaggerated, reports of it would be exaggerated, so that this would be the excuse needed to establish the need for strict security until people got used to it. Uh, and anybody moving about in a hospital would be required to wear an identification badge with uh, a photograph and telling uh, why he was there, an uh, employee or lab technician or visitor or whatever. And this is to be brought in gradually, getting everybody used to the idea of identifying themselves uh, until it was just accepted. This need for ID to move about uh, would start in small ways, uh, hospitals, some businesses, but gradually expand to include everybody in all places. It was observed that hospitals can be used to confine people uh, for the treatment of criminals. This did not mean necessarily medical treatment. Uh, at, at, that, at that time, I did not know the word psycho prison, as in the Soviet Union, but uh, uh, without trying to recall all the details, basically it was uh, describing the use of hospitals both for treating the sick and for confinement of criminals for reasons other than the medical well-being of the criminal. Definition of criminal was not given. The image of the doctor would change. No longer would the, he be seen as an individual professional in service to individual patients. But the doctor would be uh, gradually uh, recognized as a highly skilled technician um, and uh, his job would change. The job uh, is to include uh, things like executions by lethal injection. Uh, the image of the doctor as being a powerful, independent person would have to be changed. And he went on to say, uh, doctors that make entirely too much money, uh, they should advertise like any other product. Lawyers would be advertising too. <coughs> uh, keep in mind, this was a, an audience of doctors being addressed by a doctor. And it was uh, interesting that he would make uh, some rather insulting statements to his audience uh, without fear of uh, antagonizing us. The solo practitioner would become a thing of the past. Uh, a few diehards might try to hold out, but most uh, doctors would be employed by an institution of one kind or another. Uh, group practice would be encouraged, uh, corporations would be encouraged, and then once the corporate image of medical care, uh, as this graduate became more and more acceptable, Doctors would more and more become employees rather than independent contractors. And along with that, of course, uh, unstated but necessary is the employee serves his employer, not his patient. So that's, uh, and we've already seen quite a lot of that uh, in the last 20 years and apparently more on the horizon. Uh, the term HMO was not used at that time, but as you look at HMOs, uh, uh, you see this is the uh, way that uh, medical care is being taken over since the national health insurance approach uh, did not uh, get through the Congress. A few diehard doctors may try to uh, make go of it remaining in solo practice, uh, remaining independent, which parenthetically is me, um, but they would suffer uh, great loss of income. They'd be able to scrape by maybe, but uh, never uh, really live comfortably as those who were willing to become employees of the system. Ultimately, there would be no room at all for the solo practitioner after the system is entrenched. Uh, next heading to talk about is health and disease. He said there would be new diseases to appear, which uh, had not ever been seen before, 
would be very difficult to diagnose and be untreatable, uh, at least for a long time. No elaboration was made on this, but uh, I remember not long after hearing this presentation when I had a puzzling uh, diagnosis to make, I would be wondering, is this what he was talking about? Is this a case of what he was talking about? Uh, some years later, uh, as age uh, ultimately developed, I think age was at least one example of what he was talking about. I now think that AIDS probably is a manufactured disease. Cancer. He said, we can cure almost every cancer right now. Information is on file in the Rockefeller Institute uh, if it's ever decided that it should be released. But consider, if people stop dying of cancer, how rapidly we would become overpopulated. You may as well die of cancer or something else. Efforts at cancer treatment would be geared more toward uh, comfort and toward cure. There was some statement that ultimately the cancer cures which were being hidden in the Rockefeller Institute would come to light because independent researchers might uh, bring them out uh, despite these efforts to suppress them. But at least for the time being, uh, letting people die of cancer uh, was a good thing to do because it would uh, slow down the problem of overpopulation. Another very interesting thing was heart attacks. Uh, he said, there is now a way to simulate a real heart attack. It can be used as a means of assassination. Only a very skilled pathologist who knew exactly what to look for at an autopsy could distinguish this from the real thing. I thought that was a very surprising and shocking thing to hear from this particular man at that particular time. Uh, this and the business of the cancer cure uh, really still stand out sharply in my memory because they were so shocking and at that time seemed to me out of character. He then went on to talk about nutrition and exercise uh, sort of in the same framework. People would not have to, people would have to eat right and exercise right to live as long as before. Most won't. Uh, this in the connection of uh, nutrition, there was no specific statement that I can recall as to particular nutrients that would be either uh, inadequate or in excess. In retrospect, I tend to think he meant high salt diets and high fat diets would predispose toward uh, high blood pressure and premature arteriosclerotic heart disease and that if people were too dumb or too lazy to exercise as they should, then their uh, dietary, their uh, circulating fats would go up and predispose to disease. And he said something about diet information, about proper diet would be widely available, but most people, uh, particularly stupid people who had no right to continue living anyway, um, they would ignore the advice and just go on and eat what was convenient and tasted good. There were some other unpleasant things said about food. I just can't recall what they were, but I do remember of uh, having uh, reflections about wanting to plant a garden in the backyard to get around whatever these contaminated foods would be. Uh, I regret I don't remember the details. Uh, the rest of this about nutrition and uh, hazardous nutrition. Uh, with regard to exercise, he went on to say that uh, more people would be exercising more, especially running, uh, because every everybody can run. You don't need any special equipment or place. Uh, you can run wherever you are. Uh, as he put it, people will be running all over the place. And uh, in this vein, he pointed out how supply produces demand, and this was in reference to athletic clothing and equipment, uh, as this would be... Uh, made uh, more widely available and glamorized, uh, particularly as regards running shoes. Uh, this would stimulate people to uh, develop an interest in running, and as part of a whole sort of public propaganda campaign, people would be encouraged then to uh, buy the uh, attractive sports equipment and to uh, get into exercise. Again, uh, 
Well, in connection with nutrition, he also mentioned that uh, public eating places would rapidly increase. That uh, uh, This had a connection with the family, too, as more and more people ate out, eating at home would become less important. Uh, people would be less dependent on their kitchens at home. And then this also connected to uh, convenience foods being made widely available. Uh, things like you could pop into the microwave, uh, whole meals would be uh, available prefixed. And of course we've now seen this uh, in some pretty good ones. But this whole different approach to eating out and to uh, uh, previously uh, prepared meals being eaten in the home was uh, predicted at the time to be brought about uh, convenience foods. And uh, the convenience foods that would be part of the hazard, anybody who was uh, lazy enough to want the convenience foods rather than fixing his own also better be energetic enough to exercise uh, because if he was too lazy to exercise and too lazy to uh, fix his own food uh, then he didn't deserve to live very long. This was all presented as sort of a moral judgment about people and what they should do with their energies. People who are smart who would learn about nutrition and who are disciplined enough to eat right and exercise right are better people and are the kind you want to live longer. Somewhere along in here, there is also something uh, about accelerating the onset of puberty. And this was said in connection with health. And later, in connection with education, and connected to accelerating the process of evolutionary change there was a statement that we think we can push evolution faster and in the direction we want it to go. I remember this only as a general statement. I don't recall if any uh, details were given uh, beyond that. Another area of discussion was religion. Uh, this is a, an avowed atheist speaking. Uh, and he said, religion is not necessarily bad. A lot of people seem to need religion with its mysteries and rituals, so they will have religion. But the major re religions of today have to be changed because they are not compatible with the changes to come. The old religions will have to go, especially Christianity. Once the Roman Catholic Church is brought down, the rest of Christianity will follow easily. Then a new religion can be accepted for use all over the world. It will incorporate something from all of the old ones to make it more easy for people to accept it and feel at home in it. Most people won't be too concerned with religion. They will realize that they don't need it. In order to do this, the Bible will be changed. It will be rewritten to fit the new religion. Gradually, key words will be replaced with, with new words having various shades of meaning. Then the meaning attached to the new word uh, can be close to the old word. And as time goes on, other shades of meaning of that word can be emphasized. And then gradually, that word replaced with another word. Um, I don't know if I'm making that clear, but the idea is that uh, everything in Scripture need not be rewritten, just key words replaced by other words and uh, the variability in meaning attached to any word can be uh, used as a uh, tool to change the entire meaning of Scripture and therefore make it acceptable to this uh, new religion. Most people won't know the difference, and this is another one of the times where he said, the few who do notice the difference won't be enough to matter. Then followed one of the most surprising statements of the whole presentation. He said, some of you probably think the churches won't stand for this. And he went on to say, the churches will help us. There was no elaboration on this. Uh, it was unclear just uh, what he had in mind when he said the churches will help us. In retrospect, I think uh, some of us now can understand what he might have meant at that time. I recall then only of thinking, no, they won't and remembering our Lord's words uh, where he said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, 
Uh, yes, uh, some people in the churches might help, and in the subsequent 20 years we've seen how uh, some people in churches have helped. But we also know that our Lord's words uh, will stand, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Another area of discussion was education, and uh, one of the things in connection with education that uh, I remember connecting with what he said about religion was, uh, uh, in addition to changing the Bible, he said that uh, classics in literature would be changed. Um, I seem to recall Mark Twain's writings was given as uh, one example, but he said the uh, casual reader reading a revised version of a classic would never even suspect there was any change and uh, somebody would have to go through word by word to even recognize that any change was made in these classics. The changes would be so subtle, but the changes would be such as to uh, uh, promote the uh, acceptability of the new system. As regards education, he indicated that uh, kids would spend more time in schools, but in many schools they wouldn't learn anything. Uh, they'll learn some things, but not as much uh, as formerly. Better schools in better areas with better people. Their kids will learn more. Uh, in the better schools, learning would be accelerated. And this was uh, another time where he said, we think we can push evolution. By pushing kids to learn more, he seemed to be suggesting that uh, their brains would evolve and that their offspring then would uh, evolve, uh, sort of pushing evolution in, uh, uh, where, where kids would learn and be more intelligent at a younger age, as if this pushing would alter their physiology. Overall, schooling would be prolonged. Uh, this meant uh, prolonged throughout the school year. I'm not sure what he said about a long school day. I do remember he said that school was planned to go all summer, that the summer school vacation would become a thing of the past, not only for schools but for other reasons. People would begin to think of uh, vacation times year-round, not just in the summer. Uh, for most people, it would take longer to complete their education uh, to get what originally had been in a bachelor's program uh, would now require advanced degrees and more schooling. So that a lot of school time uh, uh, would be just wasted time. Good schools would become more competitive. I inferred when he said that that he was including all schools, elementary up through college, but I don't recall uh, uh, whether he said that. Students would have to decide at a younger age what uh, they would want to study and get onto their track early if they would qualify. Uh, it would be harder to change to another field of study once you got started. Uh, studies would be concentrated in much greater depth but narrowed. You wouldn't have access to material in other fields outside your own area of study uh, without approval. Uh, this seemed to be more uh, where he talked about limited access to other fields. Uh, I seem to recall that as being more at the college level, high school and college level, perhaps. Uh, people would be very specialized in their own area of expertise, but they won't be able to get a broad education and won't be able to understand what is going on overall. He was already talking about computers in education, and at that time he said anybody who wanted computer access or access to books that were not directly related to their field of study uh, would have to have a very good reason uh, for so doing. Otherwise, access would be denied. Uh, another angle was that the schools would become uh, more important in people's overall life. Uh, kids, in addition to their academics, would have to get into school activities unless they wanted to feel completely out of it. But spontaneous uh, activities among kids uh, the thing that came to my mind when I heard this was uh, Sandlot football and Sandlot baseball teams that we uh, worked up uh, as kids growing up. I said to kids uh, wanting any activities outside of school would be almost forced to get them through the school. There would be few opportunities outside. Now the pressures of uh, the accelerated academic program and uh, uh, accelerated demands where kids would feel they had to be part of something uh, 
one or another athletic club or some school activity. Uh, these pressures he recognized would cause some students to burn out. He said the smartest ones will learn how to cope with the pressures and to survive. There will be some help available to students in handling stress, but the unfit won't be able to make it. They will then move on to other things. Uh, in this connection, and later on in the connection with uh, drug abuse and alcohol abuse, he indicated that psychiatric services to help would be increased dramatically. In all the pushing for achievement, uh, it was recognized that uh, many people would need help and the people worth uh, keeping around would be able to accept and benefit from that help and still be super achievers uh, those who could not would fall by the wayside and therefore were uh, sort of uh, dispensable, expendable, I guess is the word I want. Education would be lifelong. Uh, adults would uh, be going to school. There will always be new information that adults must have to keep up. When you can't keep up anymore, you're too old. This was uh, uh, another way of letting older people know that uh, the time had come for them to move on and take the demise pill. If you got too tired to keep up with your education, uh, you got too old to learn new information, then uh, this was a signal you begin to prepare to get ready to step aside. In addition to revising the classics, which I alluded to a while ago uh, with revising the Bible, he said some books would just disappear from libraries. This was in the vein that uh, some books contain information or contain ideas that uh, should not be kept around and therefore uh, those books would disappear. Uh, I don't remember exactly uh, if he said how this was to be accomplished, but I seem to recall carrying away the idea that uh, this would include thefts, that certain people would be uh, designated to go to certain libraries and pick up certain books and just uh, get rid of them. Uh, not necessarily as a matter of policy, just simply steal it. Further uh, down the line, uh, not everybody will be allowed to own books. In some books, nobody will be allowed to own. Another area of discussion was laws that would be changed. Uh, at that time, a lot of states had blue laws about Sunday sales and certain Sunday activities. They said the blue laws would all be repealed. Gambling laws would be repealed or relaxed so that gambling would be increased uh, indicated then that governments would get into gambling. We've had a lot of uh, state lotteries pop up around the country since then. And uh, at the time, uh, we were already being told that would be the case. Uh, why should all that gambling money be kept in private hands when uh, the state could benefit from it was the rationale behind it. But people should be able to gamble if they want to, so it would become a civil activity rather than a private or illegal activity. Bankruptcy laws would be changed. I don't remember the details, but just that they would be, and uh, I know subsequent to that time they have been. Antitrust laws would be changed or be interpreted differently or both. In connection with the changing antitrust laws, there was some statement that, uh, in a sense, competition would be increased. Uh, but this would be increased competition within otherwise controlled circumstances. So it's not a free competition. Uh, I, re I recall having the impression that it was uh, like competition, but within members of a club, there would be nobody outside the club who would uh, be able to compete. Sort of like uh, teams competing within a professional sports league, if you're in the NFL or the uh, uh, American or National Baseball Leagues. Uh, you compete within the league, but the league is all in agreement on what the rules of competition are. Not a not a really free competition. Drug use would be increased, alcohol abuse would be increased, and law enforcement efforts against drugs would be increased. On first hearing that, it sounded like a contradiction. Uh, why increase drug abuse and simultaneously increase law enforcement against drug abuse? Uh, but the idea is that uh, in part, the increased availability of drugs would provide a sort of law of the jungle whereby the weak and the unfit would be selected out. Uh, there was a statement made at that time, uh, 
before the earth was overpopulated, there was a law of the jungle where uh, only the fittest survived. You had to be able to protect yourself against the elements and wild animals and disease, and if you were fit, you survived. Uh, but now that we've become so civilized, we're over-civilized, and the unfit are unable to survive only at the expense of those who are more fit. And the uh, abuse of drugs then would restore, in a certain sense, the law of the jungle and selection of the fittest for survival. News about drug abuse and law enforcement efforts would tend to keep drugs in the public consciousness uh, and uh, would also tend to reduce uh, this unwarranted American complacency that the world is a safe place and a nice place. The same thing would happen with alcohol. Alcohol abuse would be both promoted and uh, demoted at the same time. The vulnerable and the weak would respond to the promotions and therefore use and abuse more alcohol. Uh, drunk driving would become more of a problem and strict rules about driving under the influence would be established so that uh, more and more people would lose their privilege to drive. This also had connection with uh, something we'll get to later about overall restrictions on travel. Uh, not everybody should be free to travel uh, the way they do now in the United States. People don't have a need to travel that way. It's a privilege, was kind of the high-handed way it was put. Again, much more in the way of psychological services would be made available to help those who uh, got hooked on drugs and alcohol. The idea being that uh, in order to promote this, drug and alcohol abuse to screen out some of the unfit, people who otherwise are pretty good also would be subject to getting hooked. and. Uh, if they were really worth their salt, they would have enough sense to seek uh, psychological counseling and to benefit from it. So this was presented as sort of a redeeming value on the part of the, uh, of the planners. Uh, it was as if he were saying, you think we're bad in promoting these uh, evil things, but look how nice we are. We're also providing a way out. More jails would be needed. Hospitals could serve as jails. Some new hospital construction would be designed so as to make them adaptable to jail-like use. This is tape number two on the new order of barbarians. Change. Nothing is permanent. Streets would be rerouted, renamed. Areas you had not seen in a while then would become unfamiliar. Uh, among other things, this would... Uh, contribute to older people feeling that it was time to move on. Uh, they couldn't even, people would feel they couldn't even keep up now with uh, the changes in areas that were once familiar. Vacant buildings would be left to stand empty and to deteriorate, and streets would be allowed to deteriorate in certain localities. The purpose of this was to provide the jungle, the depressed atmosphere for the unfit. Uh, Somewhere in this same connection, he mentioned uh, buildings and, be bri and bridges uh, would be made so that they would collapse after a while. There would be uh, more accidents uh, involving uh, airplanes and railroads and automobiles. All of this to contribute to the feeling of uh, insecurity that nothing was safe. Not too long after this presentation, uh, and I think one or two even before in the area where I live, we had some uh, newly constructed bridge to break, uh, another newly constructed bridge uh, defect discovered before it broke. And I remember of reading just scattered incidents around the country where shopping malls would fall in uh, right where they were filled with shoppers. And I remember that uh, one of the shopping malls in our area, the first building I'd ever been in where you could feel this vibration throughout the entire building when there were a lot of people in there. Uh, and I remember wondering at that time whether this uh, shopping mall was one of the buildings he was talking about. Talking to uh, construction people and architects about it, they'd say, oh no, that's good. Uh, building vibrate like that, that means it's it's flexible and not rigid. 
Well, <laughs> maybe so. We'll wait and see. Other areas, though, would be well maintained. Uh, not not every part of the city would be slum. There, there would be uh, the created slums and other areas well maintained. Uh, those people able to leave the slum for better areas then would learn to better appreciate the importance of human accomplishment. Uh, this meant that uh, uh, if they left the jungle and came to civilization, so to speak, uh, they could be proud of their own accomplishments, that they made it. There was no uh, related sympathy for those who were left behind in the, in the jungle of uh, drugs and uh, deteriorating uh, neighborhoods. And then a statement that was kind of surprising. We think we can effectively limit crime to the slum areas so it won't be spread uh, heavily into better areas. I should maybe point out here, uh, these are not obviously not word-for-word -word quotations after 20 years, but uh, where I say that I'm quoting, I'm giving the general drift of what was said close to word-for-word, -word, perhaps not precisely so. But anyhow, I remember wondering, uh, how can you be so confident that uh, uh, the criminal element is going to stay where you want it to stay? But uh, he went on to say there would uh, be increased security would be needed in the better areas. Uh, that would mean uh, more police, uh, better coordinated police efforts. Uh, he did not say so, but I wondered at that time about the... Uh, moves that were afoot to consolidate all the police uh, departments of suburbs around major cities. Uh, I think the John Birch Society was one who was saying, support your local police, don't let them be consolidated. And uh, I remember wondering if that was one of the things he had in mind about security. It was not explicitly stated. But anyhow, he went on to say there would be a whole new industry of residential security systems uh, to develop with alarms and locks and uh, alarms going into the police department so that uh, people could protect their wealth and their well-being. Because uh, some of the criminal activity would spill out of the slums into better, uh, more affluent-looking areas that looked like they'd be worth burglarizing. But, uh, and again, it was stated uh, like as a redeeming quality. See, we're generating all this more crime, but look how good we are. We're also generating uh, the means for you to protect yourself against the crime. Uh, sort of repeated thing throughout this presentation was the uh, uh, recognized uh, evil and then the uh, self-forgiveness saying, well, see, we've given you way out. American industry came under uh, discussion. It was the first that I'd heard uh, of the term global interdependence or that notion. Uh, the stated plan was that different parts of the world would be assigned different roles of industry and commerce in a unified global system. The continued preeminence of the United States and the relative independence and self-sufficiency of the United States would have to be changed. Uh, this uh, was one of the several times where he said, in order to create a new structure, you first have to tear down the old. And uh, American industry was uh, one example of that. Uh, our system would have to be curtailed in order to give other countries a chance to build their industries uh, because uh, they would otherwise they would not be able to compete against the United States. And this was especially true of our heavy industries uh, that would be cut back uh, while uh, the same industries were being developed in other countries, uh, notably Japan. And at this point there was uh, some discussion of steel and particularly automobiles. I remember saying that uh, automobiles would be... Uh, imported from Japan on a uh, uh, equal footing with uh, our own domestically produced automobiles, that the Japanese product would be better. Uh, things would be made so they would break and fall apart. Uh, that is in the United States. Uh, so that uh, people would tend to prefer the imported variety, and this would give a bit of a boost to uh, foreign competitors uh, 
one example uh, was Japanese. In 1969, Japanese automobiles, uh, if they were sold here at all, I don't remember, but they certainly weren't very popular. But the idea was you would uh, get a little bit disgusted with your uh, Ford uh, GM or Chrysler product or whatever because uh, little things like uh, window handles would fall off more and plastic parts would break uh, that, had they been made of metal, would hold up. Your patriotism about buying American would soon uh, give way to practicality that if you bought uh, Japanese or German or imported, uh, that it would last longer and you'd be better off. Patriotism would go down uh, down the drain then. There was mention elsewhere of things uh, being made to fall apart too. Uh, uh, one of the, I don't remember specific items that, uh, if they were even stated, uh, other than automobiles, but I do recall of having the impression, uh, sort of in my imagination, of uh, a surgeon having something fall apart in his hands in the operating room at a critical time. Uh, was he including this sort of thing in his uh, discussion? But somewhere uh, in this uh, discussion about things being made deliberately defective and unreliable, not only was to tear down patriotism, but to be just a little source of irritation to people who would use such things. Again, the idea that you not feel terribly secure, promoting the notion that uh, the world isn't uh, a terribly reliable place. The United States was to be kept strong in information, communications, high technology, education, and agriculture. Uh, the United States was seen as continuing to be sort of the, uh, the keystone of this global system, but uh, heavy industry would be transported out. One of the comments made about heavy industry was uh, we had had enough environmental damage from smokestacks and industrial waste, and some of the other people could put up with that for a while. This, again, was supposed to be a redeeming uh, quality for Americans to accept. Uh, you took away our industry, but you saved our environment. So uh, we really didn't lose anything. Uh, and along this line, there were talks. Uh, there was then discussion about uh, people losing their jobs as a result of industry and uh, opportunities for retraining. And particularly, uh, population shifts would be brought about. This is sort of an aside, but I think I'll explore the aside before I forget it more. Population shifts were, brought, were to be brought about so that uh, people would be tending to move into the Sun Belt. Uh, there would be uh, sort of people without roots in their new locations. And uh, traditions are easier to change in the place where there are a lot of transplanted people as compared to trying to change condition traditions in a place where people grew up and had an extended family where they had roots. Uh, things like new medical care systems, if you pick up from uh, northeast industrial city and you transplant yourself to the uh, south, Sunbelt or southwest, uh, you'll be more accepting of whatever kind of, uh, for example, controlled medical care you find there than you would accept a change in the medical care system uh, where you had roots and the support of your family. Also in this vein, uh, it was mentioned that uh, uh, he used the uh, plural personal pronoun we. We take control first of the port cities, New York, San Francisco, Seattle. The idea being that uh, this is a piece of strategy. The idea being that uh, if you control the port cities with your philosophy and your way of life, the heartland in between has to yield. Um, I can't elaborate more on that. Uh, but it is interesting that if you look around the most liberal areas in the country, uh, and progressively so are the uh, seacoast cities, the heartland, uh, the Midwest, uh, does seem to have uh, maintained its conservatism. But as you take away industry and jobs and relocate people, then this is a strategy to break down conservatism. Uh, when you take away industry and people are unemployed and poor, they will accept whatever change seems to offer them survival and their morals and their 
uh, commitment to things will all give way to survival. That's not my philosophy, that's the speaker's philosophy. Uh, anyhow, uh, going back to industry, uh, some heavy industry would be remain uh, just uh, enough to maintain sort of a seed bed of industrial skills, uh, which could be expanded if the plan didn't work out as it was intended, uh, so that we, uh, the country would not be devoid of assets and uh, skills. But uh, this was just sort of a contingency plan. It was uh, hoped and expected that uh, the worldwide specialization would uh, be carried on. But uh, uh, perhaps repeating myself, but one of the upshots of all of this is that uh, with this global interdependence, then national identities would uh, tend to be de-emphasized. Uh, each area dependent on every other area for one or another elements in, in a, its life. Uh, we would all become citizens of the world rather than citizens of any one country. And along these lines, then, uh, we can talk about sports. Sports in the United States was to be changed uh, in part as a way of de-emphasizing nationalism. Soccer. A worldwide sport uh, was to be emphasized and pushed in the United States. And uh, this was of interest because in this area, the game of soccer was virtually unknown at that time. I had a few friends who attended an elementary school other than the one I attended where they played soccer at their school, and they were a, a real novelty. This was back in the 50s. So to hear this man speak of soccer in, the, in this area uh, was kind of surprising. But anyhow, soccer is seen as a, an international sport and would be promoted, and uh, the traditional sport of American baseball uh, would be de-emphasized and possibly eliminated. Uh, eliminated because it uh, might be seen as too American. And uh, he discussed how to, uh, eliminating this uh, one's first reaction might be, well, you pay the players poorly and they don't want to play for poor pay, so they give up baseball and either go into some other sport or some other activity. But he said that's really not how it works. Uh, actually, uh, the way to break down the uh, baseball would be to uh, make the salaries go very high. And uh, the idea behind this was that uh, as the salaries got ridiculously high, there would be a certain amount of uh, discontent uh, and antagonism as people uh, resented athletes being paid so much, and the athletes uh, would begin more and more to resent among themselves uh, what other players were paid and uh, would tend to abandon the sport. And these high salaries then also could break the owners and uh, alienate the fans. And then the fans would support soccer, and the baseball fields could be used as soccer fields. Uh, wasn't said definitely this would have to happen, but if the international flavor didn't come around uh, rapidly enough, uh, this could be done. There was some comment uh, along the same lines about football, although... Uh, I seem to recall he said football would be harder to uh, dismantle uh, because it was so widely uh, in the colleges as well as the professional leagues and would be harder to tear down. And there was something also about the uh, violence in football that met a psychological need that was perceived and uh, people have a need for this vicarious violence and uh, so football, for that reason, might be left around to meet that vicarious need. Um, same thing, too, with hockey. Uh, hockey uh, had more of an international flavor and would be emphasized. There was some foreseeable international competition uh, about hockey and particularly soccer. At that time, hockey was international between the United States and Canada. Uh, I was kind of surprised because I thought the speaker uh, just never impressed me as uh, being at all a hockey fan, and, he, <laughs> and I am. 
but uh, and it turns out he was not. Uh, he just knew about the game and uh, what it would do to this changing sports program. But in any event, soccer was to be the keystone of athletics because it's already a worldwide sport. Uh, it's South America and Europe and parts of Asia and the United States should get on the bandwagon. And all this would foster international competition so that we would all become citizens of the world to a greater extent than citizens of our own narrow nations. There was some discussion about hunting, uh, uh, not surprisingly, hunting requires guns and gun control is a big uh, element in these plans and uh, I don't remember the details much, but uh, the idea is that gun ownership is a privilege and not everybody should have guns and hunting was an inadequate excuse for owning guns and uh, everybody should be uh, restricted in gun ownership, the few privileged people who should be allowed to hunt could maybe rent or borrow a gun from official quarters rather than own their own. After all, everybody doesn't have a, have a need for a gun was the way it was put. Uh, very important with sports was sports for girls. Uh, athletics would be pushed for girls, and this was intended to replace dolls. Baby dolls would still be around a few of them, but you would not see the uh, uh, number and variety of dolls, and dolls would not be pushed because girls should not be thinking about babies and reproduction. Girls should be out on the athletic field uh, just as the boys are. Girls and boys really need not be all that different. Uh, tea sets were to go the way of dolls, and all these things that... Uh, traditionally were thought of as feminine would be uh, greatly de-emphasized as girls got into uh, more masculine pursuits. And uh, just one of the things I recall was that the sports pages uh, would be full of the scores of girls' teams just right there, right along with the boys' teams. Uh, and that's uh, recently begun to, after 20 years, recently begun to appear in our local papers. The girls' sports scores are right along with the boys' sports scores. So all of this to change the role model of what a young girl should look to be uh, while she's growing up. She should look to be an athlete uh, rather than to look forward to being a mother. Uh, entertainment. Movies would gradually be made more explicit as regards sex and language. After all, sex and rough language are real. And uh, why pretend that they are not? Uh, there would be pornographic movies uh, in the theaters, on television, and uh, VCRs were not around at that time, but it indicated that uh, uh, these, these cassettes would be available and video cassette players would be available for use in the home. And pornographic movies would be available uh, on these VCRs as, uh, as well as in the neighborhood theater and uh, on your television said something like people uh, you'll see people in the movies doing everything you can think of uh, went on to say that uh, and all of this is to to bring sex out in the open that was another comment that was made several times a, a term sex out in the open uh, violence would be made more graphic this was uh, intended to desensitize people to violence there might need to be a time when people would witness real violence and be a part of it. Uh, later on, it will become clear where this is headed. Uh, so there would be more realistic violence in entertainment. Uh, would make it easier for people to adjust. Uh, people's attitudes towards death would change, and uh, they would not be so fearful of it, but more accepting of it and not be so aghast at the sight of dead people or injured people. Uh, we don't need to have a genteel population paralyzed by what they might see. Uh, people would just learn to say, uh, well, I don't want that to happen to me. This was the uh, first statement uh, suggesting that the plan includes uh, numerous human casualties uh, which the survivors would see. This particular aspect of the presentation came back in my memory very sharply a few years later when a movie about the Lone Ranger came out and I took my very young son to see it and early in the movie were some very violent scenes. Uh, one 
The victim's uh, shot in the forehead, and there was sort of a splat where the bullet entered his forehead and some blood. And I remember regretting that I took my son and remember of feeling anger toward the doctor who spoke, not that he made the movie, but uh, he agreed to be part of this movement, and I was repelled by the movie, and it brought back this aspect of his presentation very sharply in my memory. As regards music, he made a rather straightforward statement, like, music will get worse. And uh, in 1969, the rock music was uh, getting more and more unpleasant. Uh, it was interesting that just his word, the way he expressed it, it would get worse, acknowledging that it was already bad. Uh, lyrics would become uh, more openly sexual. No new sugary romantic music would be publicized like uh, that which had been written uh, before that time. All the old music would be brought back on certain radio stations and records for older people to hear. Uh, and they would, older folks would have sort of their own radio stations to hear. Uh, and the younger people, their music, as it got worse and worse, uh, would be on their stations. And he seemed to indicate that uh, one group would uh, not hear the other group's music. Older folks would just refuse to hear the uh, junk that was offered to young people. And the young people would accept the junk because it was uh, identified them as their generation and uh, helped them feel distinct from the uh, older generation. I remember at the time of thinking that would not last very long because uh, uh, even young kids wouldn't like the junk when they got a chance to hear the older music that was prettier, they would uh, gravitate toward it. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I was wrong about that. Uh, when the kids get through their teens and into their 20s, some of them improve their taste in music but uh, unfortunately uh, he was right they get used to this junk and that's all they want uh, a lot of them can't uh, stand really pretty music he went on to say that music would carry uh, a message to the young and uh, nobody would even know the message was there they just uh, think it was loud music uh, at the time i didn't uh, understand quite what he meant by that but uh, in retrospect i think we know what the messages are in the music for the young. And uh, again, he was right. This uh, aspect was sort of summarized with a notion that uh, entertainment would be a tool to influence young people. won't change the older people they are already set in their ways. Uh, but the changes would be all aimed at the young who are in their formative years, and the older generation would be passing not only could you not change them, but they're relatively unimportant anyhow. Once they live out their lives and are gone, the younger generation being formed are the ones that uh, would be important for the future in the 21st century. He also indicated all the old movies would be brought back again, and uh, I remember on hearing that, uh, through my mind ran quickly the memories of a number of old movies that... Uh, uh, I wondered if they would be included, the uh, ones that I thought I would like to see again. Along with bringing back old music and old movies for uh, older people, there were other privileges that uh, also would be accorded uh, older folks. Uh, um, free transportation, uh, breaks on uh, purchases, uh, discounts, uh, tax discounts, uh, a number of privileges just because they were older. And uh, this was uh, stated to be sort of a reward for the generation which had uh, grown up through the Depression and uh, had survived the rigors of World War II. They had deserved it and they were going to be rewarded with all these goodies. And the bringing back of the good old music and the good old movies was going to uh, help ease them through their final years in comfort. Uh, then the presentation began to get rather grim because once that generation passed, and that would be in the late 80s and the early 90s, where we are now, uh, most of that group would be gone. And then gradually uh, things would tighten up and the tightening up would be accelerated. The old movies and old songs would be withdrawn. The gentler entertainment would be withdrawn. Travel 
instead of being easy for old folks, uh, travel then would become very restricted. People would need permission to travel, and they would need a good reason to travel. If you didn't have a good reason for your travel, uh, you would not be allowed to travel. Everyone would need ID. Uh, this would at first be an ID card you would carry on your person, and you must show when you're asked for it. Uh, it was already planned uh, that later on some sort of device would be uh, developed to be implanted under the skin that would be coded specifically to identify the individual. This would eliminate the possibility of a false ID and also eliminate the possibility of people saying, well, I lost my ID. Uh, the difficulty about the skin implanted ID was stated to be getting a material that would stay in or under the skin without causing a foreign body reaction whereby the body would reject it uh, or cause infection and uh, that this would uh, have to be material uh, on which information could be recorded and retrieved by some sort of scanner while it was not rejected by the body. Silicone uh, was mentioned. Uh, silicone uh, at that time uh, was thought to be well tolerated. It was used to augment breasts. Women who felt their breasts were too small would get silicone implants. Uh, I guess that still goes on. In any event, silicone was seen at that time as the promising material to do both, to be retained in the body without rejection and to be able to retain information retrievable by electronic means. Food. Uh, food supply would come under tight control. Uh, if population growth didn't slow down, food shortages could be created uh, in a hurry and people would realize the dangers of overpopulation. Uh, ultimately, uh, whether the population slows down or not, though, the food supply is to be brought under centralized control so that uh, People would have enough to be well nourished, but they would not have enough to support any fugitive from the new system. In other words, if you had a friend or relative who didn't sign on, uh, and growing one's own food would be outlawed. This would be uh, done under some sort of pretext. In the beginning, I mentioned there were two purposes for everything. One, the ostensible purpose, and two, the real purpose. And uh, an ostensible purpose here would be that uh, growing your own vegetables was unsafe, it would spread disease or something like that. So the acceptable idea was uh, to protect the uh, uh, consumer, but the real idea is to limit the food supply and food, growing your own food would be illegal. And if you persist in illegal activities like growing food, then you're a criminal. Uh, there was a mention then of weather, W-A-T-H-E-R. This was another uh, really striking statement. He said, we can or soon will be able to control the weather. He said, I'm not merely referring to dropping iodide crystals into clouds to precipitate rain, rain that's already there, but real control. And uh, weather was uh, seen as uh, a weapon of war, a weapon of uh, influencing public policy. You could make rain or withhold rain in order to uh, influence certain areas uh, and bring them under your control. Uh, one, there were two sides to this that were kind of striking. He said, on the one hand, you can make drought during the growing season uh, so that nothing will grow. And on the other hand, you can make for very heavy rains during the harvest seasons so that the fields are too muddy to bring in the harvest. And indeed, one might be able to do both. There was no statement how this would be done that was stated that it was either already possible or very, very close to being possible. Uh, politics. He said, very few people know how government really works. Something to the effect that elected officials are influenced in ways that uh, they don't even realize. And they carry out plans that have been made for them, and they think they are making, uh, that they are authors of the plans. But uh, actually, they've been, uh, are manipulated in ways that they don't understand. Somewhere in the presentation, he made two statements that I want to insert at this time. I don't remember just where they were made, but uh, uh, they're valid uh, as in terms of the general overall view. The one statement, people can carry in their minds 
and act upon two contradictory ideas at the same time, provided these uh, two contradictory ideas are kept far enough apart. And the other one, uh, the other statement is, you, uh, you can know pretty well how rational people are going to respond to certain circumstances or to certain information that they encounter. So to determine the response you want, you need only control the kind of data or information uh, that they are presented or the kinds of circumstances they're in. And being rational people, they'll do what you want them to do. They may not fully understand what they're doing or why. Somewhere in this connection then, uh, was a statement admitting that some scientific research data could be and indeed has been falsified in order to bring about desired results. And uh, here it was uh, said, uh, people don't ask the right questions. Uh, some people are too trusting. Now, this was an interesting statement because the speaker and the audience are all being doctors of medicine and supposedly very objectively, dispassionately scientific, and science being the be-all and end-all, well, to falsify data, scientific research data, in that uh, setting is like blasphemy in the church. You just don't do that. Anyhow, out of all of this was to, uh, on the political scene, was to come the new international governing body, probably to come through the UN uh, and with the World Court, but uh, not necessarily through those structures. It could be brought about in other ways. Uh, acceptance of the UN at that time was seen as not being as wide as had been hoped. Efforts would continue to give the United Nations uh, increasing importance. Uh, people would be more and more used to the idea of relinquishing some national sovereignty. Economic interdependence would foster this goal from a peaceful standpoint. Avoidance of war would foster it uh, from the standpoint of uh, worrying about hostilities. Uh, it was uh, recognized that doing it peaceably was better than doing it by war. Uh, it was stated at this point that war is obsolete. And I thought that was an interesting phrase uh, because obsolete means something that once was seen as useful is no longer useful. But war is obsolete, uh, this being because of the uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, war is no longer controllable Formerly, uh, wars could be controlled, but if nuclear weapons would fall into the wrong hands, uh, there could be an unintended nuclear disaster. Uh, it was not stated who the wrong hands are. We were free to infer that maybe this meant terrorists, but in more recent years, I'm wondering whether the wrong hands might also include uh, people that we've assumed have had nuclear weapons all along. Maybe they don't have them. Just as it was stated that uh, industry would be preserved in the United States a little bit, just in case the worldwide plans didn't work out, just in case uh, some country or some other powerful person decided to bolt from the pack and go his own way, uh, one wonders whether this might also be true with nuclear weapons when uh, uh, you hear that uh, he said they might fall into the wrong hands. There was some statement that uh, the possession of nuclear weapons uh, has been tightly controlled, uh, uh, sort of implying that uh, anybody who had nuclear weapons uh, was intended to have them. That would necessarily have included the Soviet Union, uh, if indeed they have them. Uh, but it, I recall at the time of wondering, uh, are you telling us or are you implying that uh, that this country uh, willingly gave nuclear weapons to the Soviets? At that time, that seemed like a terribly unthinkable thing to do, much less to admit. The leaders of the Soviet Union seemed to be so dependent on the West, though, one wonders whether 
there might have been some fear that they would try to assert independence if they indeed had these weapons. So I don't know. It's something to speculate about, perhaps. Who did he mean when he said if these weapons fall into the wrong hands? Maybe just terrorists. We'll see. Anyhow, the new system would be brought in, uh, if not by uh, peaceful cooperation, everybody willingly yielding national sovereignty, then by bringing the nation to the brink of nuclear war. Uh, and everybody would be so fearful, uh, uh, as hysteria was created about the possibility of nuclear war, that there would be a strong public outcry to negotiate a peace, and people would willingly give up national sovereignty uh, in order to achieve peace, and thereby this would uh, bring in the new international political system. Uh, this uh, was stated, and a uh, very impressive thing to hear then, uh, if there were too many people in the right places who resisted this, there might be a need to use one or two, possibly more, nuclear weapons uh, as it was put, uh, this would be possibly needed to convince people that we mean business. Uh, and that was followed with a statement that uh, by the time one or two of those went off, then everybody, uh, even the most reluctant, would yield. He said something about this negotiated peace would be very convincing. This kind of uh, in a framework or in a context uh, that the whole thing was rehearsed, uh, but nobody would know it. Uh, people hearing about it would be convinced that it was a genuine negotiation between uh, uh, hostile enemies who finally had come to the realization that peace was better than war. Uh, in this context, uh, discussing war and war is obsolete, a statement was made that uh, there were some good things about war. Uh, one, uh, you're going to die anyway, and people sometimes uh, in war uh, get a chance to display great courage and heroism and uh, uh, if they die they've died well and if they survive they get recognition so that in any case the hardships of war on the soldiers uh, are worth it because that's the reward they get out of their warring. Another justification for war uh, expressed was uh, if you think of the many millions of casualties in uh, World War One and World War Two, well, suppose all those people had not died but continued to live and continued to have babies. Uh, there would be millions upon millions, uh, and we would already be overpopulated. So those two great wars served a uh, benign purpose in delaying overpopulation. But now there are technological means uh, for the individual and governments to control overpopulation. So uh, in this regard, war is obsolete. It's no longer needed. And then it's, uh, again, it's obsolete because nuclear weapons uh, could destroy the whole universe. Uh, war, once w war, which once was controllable, uh, could get out of control. And so for these two reasons, it's now obsolete. There was a discussion of terrorism. Uh, terrorism would be uh, used widely in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, terrorism that at that time was felt would uh, not be necessary in the United States. It possibly could become necessary if the United States uh, did not move uh, rapidly enough into accepting the system. Um, but at least in the foreseeable future, it was not planned and uh, very benignly <laughs> on their part. I hope maybe terrorism would not be required here, but the implication being that it would be indeed used if, uh, if it was necessary. Along with this came a little bit of a scolding that Americans have had it uh, too good anyway, and... Uh, just a little bit of terrorism would help convince Americans that the world uh, indeed is a dangerous place, or can be if we don't uh, relinquish control of the proper authorities. There was discussion of money and banking. Uh, one statement was uh, inflation is uh, infinite. You can put an infinite number of zeros after any number and put the decimal points wherever you want. Uh, this is an indication that inflation is a tool 
of controllers. Uh, money was would become predominantly credit. It was already already money is primarily a credit thing, but uh, uh, exchange of uh, money would be uh, not cash or, or palpable things, but uh, el electronic credit signals. Uh, people would carry money only in very small amounts for things like chewing gum and candy bars, just pocket sorts of things. Any purchase of uh, any significant amount would be done electronically. Uh, earnings uh, would be electronically entered into your account. It, or there would be a single banking system. It may have the appearance of being more than one, but ultimately, it basically, it would be one single banking system. So that uh, when you got paid, your pay would be entered for you into your account balance. And then when you purchased anything uh, at the point of purchase, it would be deducted, be deducted from your account balance. And you would actually carry nothing with you. Also, uh, computer records can be kept of whatever it was you purchased. So that if you were purchasing too much of uh, any particular item, uh, somebody... Yeah, some official wanted to know what you were doing with your money. They could uh, go back and review your purchases and determine uh, what it was you were buying. There was a statement uh, to the effect that any uh, purchase of significant size, like an automobile, a bicycle, a refrigerator, a radio, or television, or whatever, uh, might be uh, have some sort of identification on it where it could be traced so that very quickly anything which was either given away or stolen, uh, whatever, uh, authorities would be able to establish who purchased it and when. Computers would allow this to happen. The ability to save would be greatly curtailed. Uh, people would just not be able to save uh, any considerable degree of wealth. Uh, there was some statement of recognition that wealth represents power and uh, wealth in the hands of a lot of uh, people uh, is not good for the, the uh, people in charge so that uh, if you save too much uh, you might be taxed uh, the more you save the higher the rate of tax on your savings so your savings really could never get very far and also if you began to show a pattern of saving too much uh, you might have your pay cut people would say well you're saving instead of spending you really don't need all that money, but uh, basically the idea being to prevent people from accumulating any uh, wealth which might have long-range uh, disruptive influence on the system. People would be encouraged to uh, use credit uh, to borrow uh, and then also be encouraged to uh, uh, also be encouraged to renege on their debts so that they would uh, destroy their own credit. And the idea here is that, uh, again, if you're too stupid to handle credit wisely, uh, this gives the authorities the chance to uh, come down hard on you once you've overshot your credit. Electronic payments initially would all be based on uh, different kinds of uh, credit cards. These were already uh, in use in 1969 to uh, some extent, not as much as now. But uh, people would have uh, credit cards with the electronic strip on it. And once they got used to that, then it would be pointed out the advantage of having all of this combined into a single credit card serving a single monetary system. Uh, and then you don't have to carry around all that plastic. So the next step would be the single card. And then the next step would be to replace the single card with a skin implant. Uh, the single card could uh, be lost or stolen give rise to problems, uh, could be exchanged with somebody else to confuse identity. Uh, the skin implant, on the other hand, uh, would be uh, not losable or counterfeitable or transferable to another person. So you and your accounts would be identified without uh, any possibility of error. And the skin implant, of course, would have to be put somewhere that was convenient to the scanner for example, your right hand or your forehead. At that 
time when I heard this, I was unfamiliar with the statements in the book of Revelation. Uh, the speaker went on to say, now some of you people who read the Bible uh, will attach significance to this, uh, to the Bible. But he went on to uh, disclaim any biblical significance at all. This is just common sense of how the system uh, could work and should work. And uh, there's no need to read any superstitious biblical principles into it. As I say at the time, I was not uh, very familiar with the uh, words of Revelation. Uh, shortly after that, I became familiar with them, and the uh, significance of what he said really was striking. I'll never forget it. There was some mention also of implants uh, that would lend themselves to surveillance by providing radio signals. Uh, this could be under the skin or a dental implant, uh, put in like a filling, uh, so that uh, either fugitives or uh, possibly every citizen could be identified by a certain frequency from his uh, personal transmitter and could be located at any time or in any place by any authority who wanted to find him. This would be particularly useful if somebody uh, broke out of prison. There was more discussion of uh, personal surveillance. Uh, one thing was said, uh, you'll be watching television and somebody will be watching you at the same time at a central monitoring station. Uh, television sets would have a device to enable this. The TV set would not have to be on in order for this to be operative. Uh, also, the television set can be used to monitor what you are watching. People. Uh, can tell what you're watching on the TV and how you're reacting to what you're watching. Uh, and uh, you would not know that you were being watched while you were watching your television. Uh, how would we get people to accept these things into their homes? Well, people would buy them when they buy their own television. They won't know that they're on there at first. Uh, this was... Uh, described as being by uh, what we now know as cable TV to replace antenna TV. When you buy a TV set, this monitor would uh, just be a part of the set and most people uh, would not have enough knowledge of electronics to know it's there in the beginning. And then the, uh, the cable would be the means of carrying the surveillance uh, message to the monitor. By the time uh, people found out uh, that this monitoring was going on, they would also be already very dependent upon television for a number of things. Uh, just the way people are dependent on the telephone today, one thing the television would be used for would be purchases. You wouldn't have to leave your home to purchase. You just turn on your TV and there would be a way of interacting with the television uh, channel to the store that you wanted to purchase and you could flip the switch from uh, place to place to choose a refrigerator or clothing. Uh, this would be both convenient but it all also would make you dependent on the television so that the built-in monitor is something you could not uh, do without. There was some discussion of audio monitors too uh, just in case uh, the authorities wanted to hear what was going on and in rooms other than where the television monitor was. And uh, in regard to this uh, statement was made, any wire going into your house, for example, your, your telephone wire could be used this way. I remember this in particular because it was fairly near the end of the presentation and as we were leaving the uh, meeting place, I said something to one of my colleagues about going home and pulling all the wires out of the house, except that I knew I couldn't get by without the telephone. And uh, the colleague I spoke to just seemed numb. He, uh, to this day, I don't think he even remembers what we talked about or, or what we heard that time, because I've asked him. But at that time, he seemed uh, stunned. Before all these changes would take place uh, with electronic monitoring, it was mentioned that there would be service trucks all over the place uh, working on the wires and putting in new cables. Uh, this is how people uh, who were on the inside would know how things were progressing. Privately owned housing would become a thing of the past. Uh, the cost of housing uh, and financing housing would gradually be made so high that uh, most people couldn't afford it. 
people who already owned their houses would be allowed to keep them. But as years go by, it would be more and more difficult for young people to buy a house. Young people would more and more become renters, particularly in apartments or condominiums. More and more uh, unsold houses would stand vacant. Uh, people just couldn't buy them. Uh, but the cost of housing would not come down. You'd right away think, well, the vacant house, the price will come down, people will buy it. But there was some statement that, uh, to the effect that the price would be held high even though there was uh, many of them available so that free marketplaces would not operate. People would not be able to buy these and gradually more and more the population would be forced into small apartments, small apartments which would not accommodate very many children. Then as the number of real homeowners uh, diminished, uh, they would become a minority. There would be no sympathy for them from the majority who dwelled in apartments and uh, then these homes could be taken by uh, increased taxes or other regulations that would be detrimental to home ownership and would be acceptable to the majority. Ultimately, people would be assigned where they would live and it would be common to have non-family members living with you, just by way of your not knowing just how far you could trust anybody. Um, this would all be under the control of a central housing authority have this in mind in 1990 when the census comes out and they ask how many bedrooms in your house, how many bathrooms in your house, do you have a finished game room? This information really is personal and of no uh, national interest to uh, government under our existing constitution, but you'll be asked those questions and uh, decide how you want to respond to them. When the new system takes over, uh, people will be expected to sign uh, allegiance to it indicating they don't have any reservations or holding back to the old system. There just won't be any room, he said, for people who won't go along. We can't have such people cluttering up the place, so such people would be taken to special places. And here I don't remember the exact words, but the uh, inference I drew was that at these special places where they were taken, uh, then they would uh, not live very long. He may have said something like disposed of humanely, but I don't remember very precisely uh, just the impression that uh, the uh, system was not going to support them when they would not go along with the system. That would leave death as the only alternative. Somewhere in this vein, he said, uh, there would not be any martyrs. Uh, when I first heard that, I thought he meant that people would not be killed, but... Uh, as the presentation developed, uh, what he meant was uh, they would not be killed in such a way or disposed of in such a way that they could serve as inspiration to other people the way martyrs do. Uh, rather, he said something like this, uh, people will just disappear. Just a few additional items sort of uh, thrown in here at the end, which I feel to include uh, where they belong more appropriately. One, uh, the bringing in of the new system, he said, probably would occur on a weekend in the winter. Everything would shut down on Friday evening and uh, Monday morning when everybody wakened, there would be an announcement made that the uh, new system was in place. During the process of getting the United States ready for these changes, um, he commented everybody would be busier with less leisure time and less opportunity for people to really look about and see what was going on around them. Also, there would be more changes, uh, more difficult to keep up as far as one's investments. Investment instruments would be changing policies, interest rates changing, so that it would be a difficult job just to keep up with what you had already earned. Interesting about automobiles, there would it would look as though there were many, many varieties of automobiles but when you looked very closely, uh, there would be great duplication. It would be made to look different with chrome and uh, wheel covers and this sort of thing. But looking closely, uh, one would see that the uh, same automobile was made by more than one manufacturer. This recently was brought home to me when I was in a parking lot and saw a small Ford, I forget the model, and a small Japanese automobile, which were identical except for little things like the number of holes in the wheel cover and the chrome around the plate and the shape of the grill. But if you looked at the basic parts of the automobiles, they were identical. 
they just happened to be parked side by side uh, where I was struck with this, and uh, I was again reminded of what had been said many years ago. I'm hurrying here because I'm near the end of the tape, and let me just summarize by saying to hear all of these things said by one individual at one time in one place uh, relating to so many different uh, human endeavors, and then to look and see how many of these actually came about, that is, changes accomplished between then and now, and the things which are planned uh, for the future, I think there's uh, no denying that uh, this is controlled and there is indeed a conspiracy. The question then becomes what to do, and I think uh, first off we must put our faith in God and pray and ask for his guidance. And secondly, I think do what we can to inform other individuals uh, as much as possible, as much as they may be interested. Some people just don't care because they're preoccupied with uh, uh, getting along in their own personal endeavors. But as much as possible, I think we should try to inform other people who may be interested and, again, put our faith and trust in God and pray constantly for his guidance and for the courage to accept what we may be facing in the near future. Rather than accept peace and justice, which we hear so much now, it's a cliche, uh, let's insist on liberty and justice for all. This is the third and the final tape on the New Order of Barbarians. This interview by Randy Engel, director of the U.S. Coalition for Life, with Dr. Larry Dunnigan, was taped on October 10, 1991, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, so I think, why don't we open up with a little bit about the man whom you are talking about on these tapes, uh, just a little profile and uh, a little bit about his education, and particularly his relationship with the, uh, with the population control establishment. I think that probably was his, his entree into much of this information. Yeah. Uh... Dr. Day was the uh, chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh from about 1959 through 64, about that period of time. And then uh, he left uh, the University of Pittsburgh and went to fill the position of medical director of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was about 1965 to 68. About that period? Yeah, that'd be about the time, 64, 65, to about 68 or 69. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he left there. Uh, I don't know specifically why. I did not know him intimately. We were, you know, more than acquainted. Uh, I was a student, and he would seek lectures. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, and so he knew my name as a student, and probably. Uh, corrected some of my test scores and, and that sort of thing. Of course, I do him and his lecturer who would stand in front of the auditorium and we, you know, listen as he talked about diseases. And take so, notes as students? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, take notes. Okay, so it was interesting. This man um, is not as well known, I think, to our listeners, like na names like Mary Calderon, um, uh, Alan Guttmacher. They were both uh, medical directors at one time or other for... Planned Parenthood, but uh, Dr. Day was not well known, and as a matter of fact, when I went back into the Seagus archives, there was very, very little information that had his actual name on it, so he was not one of the better known of the medical directors, but I'd say he probably had the scoop on what was going on uh, as well, if not better, than any of the others before or after he came. Uh, what was he doing? Uh, I mean, can you describe the scene of this particular lecture, the approximate date, and what was the occasion, and then a little bit about the audience? That oh, yeah, this was the, uh, the Pittsburgh Pediatric Society holds about four meetings each year where we have some speaker come in and talk about a medical topic related to pediatrics. And uh, this was our spring meeting, it's always late February or early part of March. This was in March of uh, 1969. And it was held at a restaurant uh, called Lamont, which is... Uh, well known in Pittsburgh. Yeah. A beautiful place. It overlooks the uh, confluence of the uh, Ohio uh, 
where the Ohio River forms here, with the confluence of the Allegheny and the Mongolian River, very, very pretty place. In, uh, um, in the tenants, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 people. Mostly um, physicians? Or? Yeah, uh, mostly physicians, uh, if not exclusively physicians. Predominantly pediatricians, but generally pediatric surgeons and pediatric radiologists, other people who were involved in medical care of children, even though they might uh, not be pediatricians as such. And the speech was given after a meal, I presume a That's very right. nice meal, and everyone was settled down and quite comfortable, quite comfortable and yeah. quite filled, and uh, really uh, an ideal state to absorb what was ever coming. But I think with the um, when you're listening to the tape, and he says some of the most, well, not only outrageous things, but also things that you would think uh, a pediatrician would kind of uh, almost jump off out of his seat out. For example, um, on the tapes when he mentioned the cancer cures. Mm -hmm. Now, there were probably doctors in the audience who had children perhaps with a, uh, uh, you know, treating a child or knowing of a child who was in need of a particular cancer cure. And to hear that they were sitting some of these, uh, you know, prescriptions for or treatments for cancer were sitting over at the Rockefeller Institute, and yet, as far as I got from the tape, everyone just kind of sat there, didn't say very much. I mean, he's talking about falsifying scientific data, and everyone just kind of yawns. And how long did the speech go on? Two hours. See, he spoke for uh, over two hours, which was longer than most of our speakers go. And uh, one of the interesting things, uh, as he finished and it was getting late, uh, uh, he said that there's much, much more, but we could be here all night, but it's time to stop. And I think that's significant, that there was much more that we never heard. Um, in the beginning of the presentation, I don't know whether I mentioned this on the, uh, at the introduction of the first tape or not, but somewhere in the beginning of this, he said, you will forget most or much of what I'm going to tell you tonight. And at the time, I thought, well, sure, that's true. We tend to forget. You know, somebody talks about ours, you can forget a lot of what they say. But uh, uh, there is such a thing as the power of suggestion. And I can't say for sure, but I do wonder if this may not have been a suggestion when we were all had a nice dinner and relaxed and listening. Well, End of an evening. We took that suggestion and, and forgot because uh, I know a number of my colleagues who uh, who were there when I would uh, some years later say, do you remember when Dr. Day said this or he said that or he said the other? And they'd say, well, yeah, I, I, I kind of, is that what he said? <laughs> no, I kind of remember that. But um, uh, most were not very impressed, which to me was surprising because, uh, well, he used the uh, example of cancer cures, but he said a number of things that... Uh, like doctors making too much money and... Yeah, you know, changing the image of the doctor, you're just going to be a high-paid technician rather than a professional who exercises independent judgment yeah. on behalf of his independent patient. Mm -hmm. A number of things I thought that uh, should have been... Uh, offensive and elicited a reaction from uh, physicians because they are physicians. Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised at how little reaction there was to it. And then other things that uh, I would have expected people to react to just because they were human beings. And uh, I think most of the people at the meeting uh, subscribe more or less to the Judeo Christian ethic and codes of behavior mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and that was violated right and left and uh, particularly one uh, one of my friends who i thought would be as disturbed as i was about this just sort of smiled <laughs> wasn't disturbed at all and i said gee this is surprising I was part of it uh, also because of his prominence i mean he was uh, the authority the authority, authority figure yeah, I think there may be something to there. This is the authority we uh, sort of uh, owe some deference here. I and mean, he couldn't possibly mean what he's saying, or there couldn't possibly be any. I mean, he's such a good guy. Uh, you know, I've often heard that phrase. Uh, mm -hmm. Geez, he's he's such a good guy. I can't believe that he'd actually, you know, I, I mean can, the things. I, I can only speculate about this, but I 
I do think at the time there was an element of disbelief about all of this, thinking, oh, this is uh, somebody's fairy tale plan, but it will never really happen because it's childish. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we know <laughs> step by step it is indeed happening right under our feet. Yeah. Um, before talking about the, uh, the, the specific areas, uh, I think there's a lot of benefits from this tape. Um, one of them is when we have a good idea of what the opposition is about and the techniques he's using, then you can turn around and uh, begin your resistance to all the types of, of manipulation and so forth. So I think that the um, uh, one of the ways I'd like to start all well, here is uh, to talk about seeing that there were four or five uh, like theme songs that kept on, he kept on repeating them um, over and over again. Um, for example, um, this business, which I think is so important, that people fail to distinguish uh, between the ostensible reason and the real reason. In other words, um, if you want someone to do something and you know that initially he'll um, be bulky at doing that because it's against his morals or against his religious beliefs, you have to substitute another reason that yeah. will be acceptable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after he accepts it and it's a fait accompli, then you know there's just no no turning back. Right, right. And um, it was in that connection uh, that he said people don't ask the right questions. Yeah, I and also it, too trusting. Too trusting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this was, as I recall, directed mostly at Americans. I had the feeling that he thought Europeans maybe were more, more uh, skeptical and more sophisticated, but Americans are too trusting uh -huh. and don't ask the right question. Well, with regard to this um, kind of a lack of, almost a lack of uh, discernment, uh, I guess that he, that's basically what he was saying, they were easily tricked or uh, too trusting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the thing that really flashed through my mind rather quickly is, um, for example, in schools, how quickly uh, so-called AIDS education was introduced. And it did amaze me because um, if a, you know, if a group um, stated publicly that they wanted to introduce the concept of sodomy or um, initiate uh, sex early and earlier in children, uh, and that was the reason given, uh, most parents, uh, I presume, wouldn't go for that. So you have to come up with a, another reason. And of course, the reason um, uh, for this so-called AIDS education was to uh, uh, protect children from uh, this disease. But actually, as it turns out, it's really been a, a great a boon for the homosexual network because through various things like Project 10, they have now have access to our children from the youngest years. These programs are going on from K through 12, and I imagine into, into well into college and, and beyond, so that they are reaching a, uh, a tremendous uh, segment. Uh, and speaking of children, I gathered that this speaker, uh, he, he kept on making the point about, um, well, old people, you know, they're going to go by the wayside. So I, I presume that the emphasis for these controllers or um, uh, this new world order is really an emphasis on youth. Would that be a Absolutely, yes. Emphasis on you. This was stated explicitly. Um, people beyond a certain age uh, either set in their ways, you're not going to change them. They have values, they're, they're going to stick to them. And, but you get to the youth when they're young, they're uh, pliable, you move them in the direction you want them to go. Um, so yeah, this is absolutely correct. They're, they're targeting the young, they figure uh, you old fogies that uh, don't see it our way, you're going to be dying off, or when the time comes, we're going to get rid of you. But uh, it's the youngsters we have to mold uh, in the uh, impression we want. Yeah, right. which is, is, is common sense. I think most totalitarians uh, have. Uh, uh, now, there's something about the homosexuality too, I think, uh, to expand on. I don't think this came out on the original tape. But there was, first of all, we're going to promote homosexuality. And secondly, we recognize that it's bizarre, abnormal behavior. But this is another element in the law of the jungle, because <clears throat> people are stupid enough to go along with this, aren't fit to inhabit the planet, and they'll go by the wayside. Uh, I'm not stating this precisely the way he said it, 
but it wasn't too far from there where there was some mention of diseases being created. And when I remember the one statement and remember the other statement, uh, I believe that AIDS is a disease which has been created in the laboratory. And I think uh, one purpose that AIDS serves is to get rid of the people who are so stupid as to go along with our pro-homosexual program, let them wipe themselves out. Uh, now it's hard for me to make clear how much of this is I'm remembering with great confidence and how much is sheer speculation. But as I synthesize this, uh, this is, I think, what happens. If you're dumb enough to be convinced by our promotion of homosexuality, you don't deserve a place, and you're going to fall by the wayside sooner or later right. to be rid of you. We'll select out the people who will survive are those who are also smart enough not to be deluded by our propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make sense? Well, it uh, <laughs> it certainly makes sense for them, and uh, I think also this uh, early sex initiation has the overall purpose, which I think we'll get to in depth a little later, but uh, of the sexualization of the population. Um, when he said on the tape, you know, basically uh, anything goes, I think that is, is um, what we're seeing. It's not so much that, um, let's say, someone may not adopt uh, the homosexual death style for himself, but as a result of the propaganda, he certainly will be a lot more tolerant of that type of behavior, too. So that is a, it's a desensitization, even for the individual who doesn't go over and accept it for himself. With the power of propaganda, you dare not be against homosexuals, otherwise you could label homophobe. You dare not be against any of our program for women, otherwise you're a male chauvinist pig. Uh, you know, it's like anti-Semitism. Uh, this label gets enough um, currency in the culture that uh, uh, people get shot being stuck with it. Yeah. So you, it's easier to keep quiet. Well, another theme um, was this, this business about change. Okay. And I wanted to get to change in relationship to um, religion and family, but during the, when I, the period when I was hearing this tape, I remember going to a, um, a mass, and, and uh, they happened to have at that point um, uh, a dancing girls on the altar. And so when I was sitting and, and was getting a chance to listen to the tape, I thought, as, as a Catholic, that has been, you know, if you talk about the effect of change, probably the most um, difficulty um, and, and the hardest thing has been to watch um, uh, our traditional mass um, that which Catholics have be, have practiced you know those things which they practiced and believed for so long and um, in about that time this tape or the speech was given which was about late 1969 everything had begun to turn over on its head, so much so that um, I think many people feel that now when they go into a, a, um, uh, a church where there is the novice auto, you're almost in a, in a constant state of anxiety because you're not quite sure. What am I going to encounter? What are you going to encounter now? I mean, are we going to have you look at the, um, uh, the little um, uh, song book? Of course, that's changed radically, and then you see instead of um, brethren, you see uh, people or you might see something odd happening up at the mat, you know, up at the uh, altar, which is now the table, and <laughs> so... Um, the notion of God as eternal, and the teachings of Jesus Christ as eternal, and therefore the teachings of the Church as eternal, <clears throat> depends on the authority of God, uh, and God brings about change, and God's what this boils down to me is these people say, no, we take the place of God. We establish what will change and what will not change. So if we say homosexuality or anything is moral today, wasn't yesterday, but it is today, we have said so, therefore it's moral. And we can change tomorrow. We can make it immoral again tomorrow. And this is uh, the usurpation of the role of God to define what the peons, what the ordinary person is supposed to believe. 
so the idea is that if everybody's used to change, most people aren't going to ask, well, who has decided what should be changed and how it should be changed? Most people just go along with it, like uh, hemlines and uh, shoe styles and that sort of thing. Uh, so it is a, a, a usurpation of the will of God. And if you read the Humanist Manifesto, uh, and it's somewhere early in, in the uh, introductory part of it, they say human intellect is the highest good. Well, to any human being, what you call the highest good, that's your God. So to these people, human intellect being the highest good is God. And where does human intellect reside? Well, in the brain of one or more human beings. So these people, in effect, I don't think they would be so uh, candid as to say so, but uh, whether they know it or not, what they're saying is, I am God, we are God, because we decide what is moral today, what is moral tomorrow, what's going to be moral next year. We determine change. That's right. And of course, in a nutshell, you just explained the uh, human potential, new age, all the uh, new uh, esoteric uh, movements that we've seen. Uh, but in, with regard to, to change, uh, he seemed to acknowledge that there were a couple of, of um, entities which traditionally blocked this um, this change and therefore made people resistant to uh, constant manipulation. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of those uh, is the family. Yeah. And that would include uh, uh, the family, grandmothers, grandfathers, or ethnic background, and so forth. And I guess I was impressed by everything he seemed to mention, whether it was um, economics, whether it was uh, music, had the the overall effect of diminishing the family and yes. enhancing the power of the state. Right. Yeah. That was just exactly. a constant, a constant theme. And therefore, when we're evaluating things, I think one of the things we should generally uh, say to ourselves is, what effect does that have on, on family oh, life yeah. Yeah. and the yeah. family? And uh, I think if every congressman or senator asked that question, we probably wouldn't have. Um, um, much action up on, on Capitol Hill because almost everything coming down the pike um, has uh, a uh, uh, effect of, you know, uh, disavowing, hurting the family life and enhancing the and expanding the power of government. It has an ostensible purpose <laughs> <laughs> and then it has a real purpose. Yeah, and as a as a so-called helping professional, uh, <laughs> your ability to say that was, is uh, is very interesting. Uh, uh, on that, the other, of course, uh, factor um, it's this whole factor of religion, and um, he was talking about a basically a religion without dogma, a religion that would have a little bit. Uh, from all the other traditional religions, so no one would really feel uncomfortable. Um, but and, and and actually, you know, as he said rather condescendingly, every you know, that some people need this, and if they need it, well, we'll manufacture right. something that they need. Um, but of course, it, it can't be um, anything that would uh, declare anything that they were moral absolutes or the natural law, which mean that the main target of the this. Um, group of controllers, uh, of course, was and is the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. And he mentioned the Roman Catholic Church specifically. Religion is important because <clears throat> it is eternal, and we, people who would follow the Church, will not buy our own rules about change. But if we make our own religion, we define what is religion, then we can change it as it suits us. Uh, yes, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, I was kind of flattered sitting here as a Catholic, uh, <laughs> hearing, hearing it pointed out that uh, the Church is the one obstacle that uh, he said we have to change that. And once the Roman Catholic Church falls, the rest of Christianity will fall easy. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed, though, that uh, as the conversation went on, he said, now, you may think churches will stand in your way, but I would just want to tell you that they will help oh, us. Yes. And he didn't say they will help us all except the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> he said, <Yes. laughs> they will help us. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, um, um, he was right. Yeah, he. Uh, he didn't say this explicitly, but again, uh, was one of those things that the themes that came through. He really thought the use of words was real important because he mentioned this with regard to a number of things like the Bible, um, yeah. how uh, you know the uh, very famous um, psychiatrist uh, Miru mentioned that. Uh, if you want to control people, then you control the language first, and uh, words are weapons. Uh, he apparently knew that very well, and I, I think the uh, controllers as a whole know this very well, and very of course well. it's part of their their uh, campaign. Um, but that, that little statement about, uh, about words, that words will be changed, uh, when I heard that, I thought, you know, uh, instead of saying altar, you say table. Instead of saying sacrifice, you say kneel. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the um, uh, to the mass, and uh, people say, well, that's not important. Oh, <laughs> of course, is. Is. of course, what you end up with, of course, is you you really know that that's very important. Otherwise, why would they bother to change it? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, why go through all this rigmarole of uh, if it wasn't important? It's obviously important for them because they know with the changing the words, you change they're ideas. They're taking a lot of effort and time to change it, and they're not exerting their effort on things that are unimportant. So, yes, you're absolutely right. The priest is the presider; he no longer has the role. In some cases, he no longer has the book that the priest formerly had. Yes, those words are, because words carry meaning. There's the uh, the, the dictionary definition, but uh, I think we all know that certain words carry meaning that, that uh, uh, is a little bit hard to put into words, but they carry meaning. So yes, that's uh, controlling the language. You, know, you think in your language, you think yourself in English or Spanish or whatever languages you're familiar with, but when you think you talk to yourself, and you talk to yourself in words, just the way you talk to other people. That's right. And uh, if you can, you control the language with which one person speaks to himself or one person speaks to another, you've gone a long way toward controlling what that person is able, what he's capable of thinking. And uh, that has both an inclusionary and an exclusionary component to it. Uh, you set the tone. Well, take the word gay, for example. Take the word gay. That's a, a, a good one. I have some old tapes by Fonz uh, Lehar, and then he talks about the gay hussars, you know, the, the happy um, soldiers, and uh, now you couldn't quite use that same word. Could They're you not. <laughs> get, get away with it. <laughs> so it may take months and will injure you. <laughs> But uh, again, the, you know, the, the word homosexual, um, sodomite, has been replaced with the term gay. It represents an ideology, not only a word, and when you use it, you're, it's, it's tacit to ex saying, yes, I, I accept what your interpretation of this is. And they probably had a committee working for months to pick out which word they were going to use. And gay carries a connotation which, first of all, is inaccurate. Most homosexuals are not at all gay. They're, they tend to be pretty unhappy people. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, despite all the publicity telling them that they can and should feel comfortable what they're doing, most of them deep down inside don't accept. Have a conscience which says otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And homophobia and other. Ah uh, yes, but one can hardly wait. Uh, I suppose they're going to come up with a, a, a sadophobia for those who have a hang up with a sadomasochism, and they'll have a pedopho uh, you know, pedophobia for those who have difficulties with uh, being a pedophile. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we can just look forward to uh, this type of thing. I guess we can look forward to them to the extent that we permit ourselves to permit the opposition to have access to the brain. And to dictate the terms we use. Sex education is not education. That's right. It's, it's uh, conditioning and we should never use the term sex education. It's a misnomer. They, if they control the vocabulary, then they control the way we can think and the way we can express ideas among ourselves and to anyone. But uh, sex conditioning, uh, sex, sex initiation. initiation is much more accurate, and we should insist on that. Uh, mm -hmm. kind of a, uh, we should never use terms homophobia and gay. Right. Homosexual is homosexual. It's not at all gay. That's right. Um, In fact, we're going to have to probably do some homework. Um, I know uh, probably all the popular movements in the United States 
probably, I said the pro-life movement is probably the most sensitive to words. Um, I remember that when um, I was sitting down and listening, uh, 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 talking about uh, the you know uh, media events and access to the brain. I remember that the first speech that uh, Bush gave, in which he talked about the new world order, and uh, I remember jumping halfway off my seat. <laughs> the term that here he is, the president, do you say new world order as if it was uh, you know something everyone knew about and. Uh, and um, someone looking across the room said, you know, so well, what do you, I heard that, what, what, what did he say, what did he say? He said, he said, well, he said New World Order, and well, what does that mean, you know, why is that extraordinary? Or, but anyway, this, so one of the things I think, one of the weapons that we have against the, the um, controllers is the knowledge that we can, if we can cut off his access to our mind, then, um, then we have a, a shot at um, at uh, escaping being manipulated, if not totally, at least a, 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 escape a, a good portion of the um, of the manipulation. Do you remember one of the books on um, Chinese POWs pointed out that uh, some of their survivors, in order to uh, uh, to not be brainwashed, broke their eardrums. And in that way, they were unable to hear, and being unable to hear, the enemy could not have access to their brain, and therefore um, they were able to survive where others did not. Yes. And uh, in our popular culture here, we have a number of, uh, of things that TV and radio probably primarily that uh, uh, are the constant uh, uh, means by which the opposition has access to our brain and to our children's brain. So I think one of the logical uh, conclusions and one of the very common sense conclusions is if you don't want the enemy to have access, you have to cut off <laughs> cut off the uh, lines of access, which would be in in, um, uh, in homes is simply to um, either eliminate it altogether or uh, control by uh, other forms. So. Take the network to the word. They say, you don't want to watch your programming? Turn it off. And we should. We should say, yeah, you're right. And turn it off. And let the advertisers spend their money on, on an audience that isn't there. I, uh, about, uh, as a pediatrician, I'm always interested in how kids do things and how kids uh, are, are like adults. <clears throat> and whether you're talking about international politics where one nation goes to war against another, or kids on the playground, there are certain things that are common. It's just that the kids on the playground do it on a smaller scale. <clears throat> But you mentioned cutting off access to to your brain. Somebody says, I don't want to hear it. And uh, I remember kids on the playground, I'm sure we've all seen this. Somebody's saying, yeah, yeah, Jimmy, did it. and they're teasing a the kid. What's he do? He puts his hands over his ears. He said, I'm not going to <laughs> <laughs> And the kid who wants to torment him will try to pull his hands away and be sure that he listens. And it's a strange Words. Words entering in the child knows. Words have meaning, they're hurting him. Girl goes knew it, Lennon knew it, <laughs> CBS knows it. Uh, it's, it's just interesting. It's, the principle stands across the board, it just gets more complicated as you get older, more sophisticated. But whereas kids on a playground, you'll learn a whole lot of uh, dots <laughs> in the world. I had to just sort of slip that in. Yeah, I think um, most of us are shaking our heads uh, at that one. Um, this uh, Dr. Day was very much into the whole population control um, uh, establishment, and uh, he was, of course, uh, in, in favor of abortion. But as he again started talking about um, the aged and euthanasia, I recall uh, one of the books, a uh, population control book, saying that uh, birth control without death control was meaningless. And one of the, uh, if we can use the expression, um, one of the advantages in, in term is, if, if one was favorable toward uh, the killing of the aged, uh, one of the favorable things is in fact abortion for the simple reason is that universally speaking, abortion has the result of bringing about a rather inordinate chopping off 
of population at the front end, that is at, at the birth end. Yes. And the inevitable effect is that you will have a population which is top heavy mm -hmm. with an, a rapidly aging population, which is the current state in the United States. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, <clears throat> if you are going to go about killing the young, especially at the pace of we seem to have adopted ourselves to in this country, then invariably um, you're going to have to do something about all those aging populations because the few children who are born, uh, after all, they cannot be expected to carry this tremendous burden of all these these people. So you're cutting one end right. and uh, therefore inevitably, um, as you pointed out on the tape, he was saying, well, these few young people who were permitted to be born will really feel this inevitable burden on them, and so they'll be more uh, sensitized, desensitized. They'll be more warmed up to the idea of, uh, of grandma and grandpa having this little party, and then um, uh, shuffling off to the, you know, the uh, wherever they shuffle off to, and uh, whether it's taking the demise pill or uh, going to a, you know, a death camp or. There was a movie out some years back called Soylent Green. Oh, yes. Do you remember Soylent? Yes, I remember it very distinctly. And Charles Heston was the... I only saw parts of the movie. I never saw the whole thing from beginning to end. But Edward G. Robinson went to sit in the theater and he listened to Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. That's right. As he was to take his demise pill. That's right. In fact, we also made the point that, of course, the food that the people were eating were... Each other. Uh, eat each other, right? <laughs> Just, uh, uh, and um, you know, there's, uh, yeah. But that's, uh, as he said, uh, as long as it's done with dignity right. and uh, and humanely, um, like uh, you know, putting away your horse, which is. <laughs> it's a little bit like uh, pornography. Years back, uh, when kids would come across pornography, it was always poor photography and cheap paper. And Playboy came out with the glossy pages and those really good photography. So then pornography, uh, you know, it's no longer cheap, it's respectable. We went to uh, a movie at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. Uh, I took my son along. Uh, it was a, well, the movie was the uh, Manchurian Candidate. But the, the thing... Uh, I remember the movie. Do you remember the yes, movie? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> during the previews then of other things that were going to come, it was a movie whose title I don't remember, but it was uh, well photographed in technicolor with classical music in the background, and it was a pornographic movie. And uh, I remember saying, well, if you have a guitar, then it's pornography. But if you have classical music, that converts it into art. <laughs> but it was pornography. <laughs> so, what, you know, just... Uh, Another example of uh, 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 <clears throat> example of what you were saying. As long as it's done with dignity, that's what counts. So if you kill somebody with dignity, it's okay. If you have pornography with dignity, classical music, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the point I was trying to. Make. The um, well, there were um, again talking about uh, the family. Um, Currently, I know an awful lot of people who are um, out of jobs, and he had quite a bit to say about uh, certain things like, uh, for example, heavy industry um, and uh, things like that. I, I guess what was the, the shock was that this man, I mean, I wasn't surprised that he knew a lot about uh, population control, uh, abortion, at the other end, euthanasia, but what did surprise me was that he was an individual who was talking about um, religion, law, education, um, uh, sports, entertainment, uh, food. Uh, how could one individual, and I think this is probably the question that everyone listening to these tapes is asking, how could a individual have that much input? Now, one could say, well, um, you know, it didn't pan out, but we know listening to the, these recollections 20 years later, I can't really, except perhaps for um, um, maybe some minor things, everything that he has said has truly come to pass and, and, and almost beyond, uh, uh, you know, beyond uh, the imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, how could one individual uh, talk with such a, uh, 
uh, you know, authoritative, uh, non-questioning thing that this is the way this was going to happen, and this was going to happen in fashion, and this is what we were going to see on TV, and there were going to be, you know, uh, uh, video uh, recorders before I even ever heard of the word. Uh, I, I think what happens, is certainly one individual hears this, but the plans are by no means made by one or a small number of individuals. Just as industrial corporations, they'll have a board of directors with people from all sorts of activities. They sit on the board of this corporation and they say, now if we do this to our product or we expand in this area, what will that do to banking? What will that do to clothing? What will that do, what impact, uh, ripple effect will that have on other things? And I'm sure that uh, whoever makes these plans, they have uh, representatives uh, from uh, you know every area you can think of. So they'll have educators, they'll have uh, clothing manufacturers, designers, uh, architects. Uh, uh, every aspect of every human aspect. endeavor? Or yeah, across right. the board. And then when they, I'm sure they get together uh, and, and have meetings and plan and everybody puts in his input. Just, you know, the way military operation does. Mm -hmm. What will the Navy do? Will they bombard the shore? What will the Air Force do? Will they come in with air cover? What will the infantry do? It's, it's the same thing. Uh, these people, when they plan, they don't miss a trick. They, uh, they have uh, experts in every field. They say, now, if we do this, that, and the other, John, what will that do to your operation? And he said, John will be in a position to feedback. Well, here's what I think would happen. So. Uh, it's uh, it certainly covers a broad range of uh, people, and for one individual to be able to say all of this in the two hours that he spoke to us uh, really uh, tells us that he was privy to a lot of information. And that's right. He must have been sitting in one of those boardrooms at least some point, and uh, I think perhaps not at the highest level from, from his position, but uh, enough because. Um, Anyone in the population control movement would be associated with veins of, of um, foundations, powerful foundations, powerful um, organizations, and um, and I'm sure that there's a lot that uh, was in the plans that he never heard of. I mean, he wasn't uh, a four-star general in this offense. So That's he right. Wouldn't, he wouldn't be, uh, you know, on the whole story. He was well, it's probably, too bad he couldn't have talked for six hours instead of two. Uh, we might have had a lot more <laughs> information. Um, there was a, another aspect that uh, I found fascinating in, in listening to this. Um, this this whole aspect of um, of of privacy. Um, he mentioned that um, oh, as as the uh, you know as the private homes went by, we would have individuals. Uh, non-family members perhaps uh, you know sharing our uh, apartments as i understand is is uh, becoming more popular out in, in california um oh. of course california and new york being the borders the uh, what the coast states were they and yeah, yeah. therefore the ports. the port that's right port cities port cities that that bring in things so that they can eventually work their way to middle america and uh but this, this business about privacy um when he was talking about, um, about, for example, the area of, of sex, he made the speedy marks. Uh, Who is holding on? Yeah. But the players won't be that open about their own lives. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, reserve, they'll reserve their privacy. It's for the rest of us. Yes, just like um, they're uh, listening to uh, uh, concerts and operas, and but for the mass media, they're pumping in the hard rock yeah. and um, uh, all those types of things. That was another um, fascinating thing. For example, the uh, and, and I know this has come to pass because uh, I deal with a lot of young people. But young people have their own uh, radio stations for their music, mm -hmm. and adults have their own, and never the twain shall meet. Right. And when they do, there's usually a clash right. <laughs> between the old generation and the younger. <laughs> and I think the same is probably true with uh, a lot of the, the classical movies and. Uh, uh, and and again, uh, I I can't remember when I was growing up, and my dad had the radio on. I can't re I think the music was kind of a general music that yeah. you know there wasn't. My, I didn't say to my dad, Dad, I don't like that music. Turn on to another station. 
whereas now um, there is a, a, a fabricated generational gap, uh, which again um, puts the family at, at, at the uh, the disadvantage and uh, and it creates conflict in the family, which is one of the spin-off benefits to them. Uh, if you're constantly fussing at your kids, you don't like what they're playing, and they're focusing on you, they don't like what you're playing. That does bear things to the bond of affection that you would like to be nurturing them. You know? So they're yeah. Yeah. And uh, speaking of family, again, um, one of the things, and it would appear um, for any resistance movement for the population controllers, would probably be based on families um, strengthening themselves in, in, in a number of ways. Um, one of them being uh, to um, make sure that children know about grandma and grandpa and where did they come from and developing a whole um as this uh you know uh, getting out the family albums and making sure that children know they have roots first of all and secondly uh that the, their family is is stable one father one mother with children, with grandfathers, and so forth. They're uh, harder and harder to find. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, those of us who have them should hold on to them. And so, toward the end of the tape, um, there was a, a reference to how, or, or at the time when everything would be coming together, how this new world order um, would be introduced um, to a, uh, a population which at this point, I think they would have assumed would have been uh, more than acceptable to it. How How is this put? I mean, um, we're just going to wake up one morning and, and, and the changes will be there? Or how? Do, what did he think about that? All right. <coughs> it, it was presented in one must be an oversimplified fashion. Uh, so with some qualifications, here's the recollection I have of it. Um, in the winter, and there was importance to the winter, uh, on a weekend, like on a, a Friday, an announcement would be made that, uh, that this was in place, or about to be in place. Yeah. That the order, that the, the new, new order. The new world order was now the system for the world. Mm -hmm. And we all owe this new world order our allegiance. Our allegiance. And the reason for winter is that uh, and this was stated, people less prone to travel in winter, particularly if they live in an area where there's ice and snow. Summer it's easier to get up and go. And the reason for the weekend is um, people who would have questions about this, Saturday and Sunday everything's closed and they would not have an opportunity to raise questions and file a protest and say, no, no, no. Uh, and just that period of the weekend would allow a desensitizing period so that when Monday came, and people were had an opportunity maybe to uh, express some reservation about it or even to report it, they would have had 48 hours to absorb the idea and get used to it. Cooling yeah. off period, down. Yeah. Right. Or, or a heating up period, depending on what <laughs> frame of mind. <laughs> what about uh, those who decided they didn't want to go along? Um, somewhere in there it was that because this is a new authority and it represents a change then from where your allegiance was presumed to be people would be called upon to publicly acknowledge their allegiance to this new authority and uh, this would mean that uh, you had to sign an agreement or, or in some public way uh, acknowledge that you accepted this uh, you offered your allegiance to this and before you accepted its legitimacy. And uh, there were two impressions I carried away if you did. And I'm not sure whether the two impressions are necessarily mutually exclusive because uh, this wasn't explored in great detail. Um, one of them was that uh, you would simply have nowhere to go. If you don't sign up, then you can't get any electric impulses in your banking account and you won't have any electric impulses with which to pay your rent or your mortgage or your food. You know, when your electric impulses are gone, then you have no means of livelihood. 
could you get these things from other people? Or would that be, well, in other words, let's say if you had a sympathetic family, I mean, what? But, uh, <laughs> no, you could not because the housing authority would keep those tabs on who was in, who was inhabiting um, any domicile, any, <laughs> any house, any apartment, uh -huh. any condominium. And uh, so the housing authority would be sure that people, everybody who lived there was authorized to live there. Uh, Does that get some food? And food, uh, your expenditures uh, through electronic surveillance would be uh, pretty tightly watched so that if you were spending too much money at the supermarket, uh, somebody would pick us up and say, how come? What are you doing all that food? You don't look that fat. You don't have that many people. We know you're not entertaining. What are you doing with all that food? And these things then would alert the... I have seven people in my basement who object to this new world order and we're mm -hmm. feeding them. And then they said, well, one has to go. Uh -huh. they, they, don't, they don't belong there and you can't feed them. And uh, since you're sympathetic to them, maybe your allegiance isn't very trustworthy either. So. Well, yeah, we see this really... Uh, I think the, the Chinese experience is, tells us a great deal about um, about certain things. For example, when they wanted to enforce the one-child family, what did they do? Well, of course, they cut off all education for the second child. Uh, you, your food rations were cut so that you couldn't get, uh, you know, a pregnant woman couldn't get the right, uh, right. amount of food. And ultimately, uh, still, if they found ways around that, then they, they um, uh, instituted a compulsory abortion and uh, the compulsory plugging in of the IUDs and and all this and uh, you yes. know when, when we would somewhere in the tape is this is about uh, people can carry two conflicting ideas around or even a spouse to two conflicting ideas around as long as they don't get real close together yeah. and what immediately came to mind was here we have an organization like Planned Parenthood freedom to choose freedom to choose yet they support population control programs, which is, of course, not the freedom to choose, yeah. not the freedom to choose. Yeah. And no one ever calls into account and says, now, wait a minute now, you're <laughs> freedom to choose here, but you're supporting the Chinese program, which is compulsory. And uh, I remember a statement from the uh, late Alan Gutmacher, one of the uh, medical directors of Planned Parenthood, and he said, well, uh, you know, if, if uh, people um, uh, limit their families and, and do basically what we say, we'll fine. But if we need compulsory population control, we're going to have it. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I'm just uh, I, I'm I was just curious as to what would happen um, with uh, with people who wouldn't go along, and particularly that point about um, there wouldn't be any martyrs. And that was significant because I, I can recall um, having watched some movies about the Third Reich that many times they would come late in the evening and people would be taken from their homes. But neighbors would never then ask, where did they go? Mm -hmm. they, they knew where they went. So what did you Melissa mentioned that in the Gulag Archipelago? Does he? Yeah. And I, I think this is, is, is very similar to what we, we would see. People would just disappear and you would not ask because it might endanger yourself right. or your family, Yeah. but you would know where they went. If you ask questions, you draw attention to yourself and then you might follow them to where they went. That's so right. You mind your own business and step over the starving man on the street who didn't go along. Uh, yeah, he didn't go into detail about, uh, you know, precisely how this would come about, but it's not too hard to, uh, to imagine. Uh, yeah, uh, in the past, the Nazis came, the communists came in the middle of the night and and people just disappeared and uh, um, one simple way to do this is if you're cut off from all uh, economic support uh, so you have no place to live and nowhere to eat uh, we already see a lot of homeless now uh, I just had a man in the office this morning talking about uh, he and his child seeing people living in boxes uh, downtown Pittsburgh today today it's the homeless guys living in boxes well, when the New World Order is here and you're living in a box and we can't have people littering, 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 littering <laughs> like the trash, yeah. So you come around with the wagon and you pick them up. The frame of mind as you're growing up in form is that human value resides in being productive. You have to 
uh, have a prestigious position or at least perform something useful. Make a contribution. And the truck comes by to pick up some guy who's living in a box and he's not making any contribution. Who's going to get excited about him? He's, you know, he's subhuman. He's a fetus. He's a yeah. zygote. He's a, he's a derelict. A fetus is a zygote. and a derelict. Okay. All are the same animal. So what do you do? Dispose of Who gets excited about him? You mentioned animal. Um, I recall that when uh, the Chinese communists came into power, one of the first things that they taught in schools was not any any um, thoughts about uh, you know specific political ideology, but evolution that that man was just an animal. Mm -hmm. And if man is just an animal, then we won't mind being herds and having masters who keep tabs on the animals. And uh, we're one big ant colony, and we've got someone to direct traffic and. Um, oh, and speaking of traffic, uh, getting back to, uh, we talk about the, the agent, and uh, again, people hearing this tape, are, it, it, it's phenomenal how many times this is the thing, these things on this tape will hit you. Uh, I just came back from New Jersey, which has a lot of uh, retirement type villages, and uh, I, I've been there. Um, over a period of years and there's a structure around a retirement home which has been uncompleted for, it has to at least be two or three years now they've recently completed it it's kind of a, a roadway but i think it, it would be easier to get out of a um a complex at a at a, a, a playland it is so complicated and yet the, the whole region has elderly people driving and here here we are you know um, fairly middle-aged couple, and, and for the life of us, we couldn't figure out how we were going to get out, what we were going to do, and so I asked some of the residents, I said, doesn't it bother you that they haven't fixed this road for years, and now they're, they're coming up, and this thing is so complex, you just can't go across the street, which would have been the logical thing. You have to go down, and they have a jug handle, and, and you have to go over and under, so it takes you so long, and the woman replied to me, well, you know, we just don't go out. <laughs> We just don't go out. So here we are, this little retirement village where they have made it very difficult for a population. Maybe there's a, uh, you know, 40 or 50, maybe, well, actually probably more than that, several hundred homes in this plat with only one exit. And the exit involves such a great deal of, of, of bother that they said, well, you know, we, we try to just cut down on the, the numbers or the, the, uh, the times we have to go out shopping. Right away, it makes me wonder that. If it's difficult to get out, it's also difficult to get in, probably, for visitors. These retirement homes kind of remind me of, uh, like, a b elephant burial ground. You know what I mean? <laughs> but there's no, uh, the one thing you notice is there's no children. There's not the laughter of children in these homes. My experience has been that people in, uh, like, retirement homes, uh, nursing homes, when they see a child, they just blossom. They, they're really delighted to see a child. Sure, they're happy to have their sons and daughters come, other adults. But when they see a child, it doesn't even have to be their own. It just has a, uh, a very beneficial uh, effect on their mood. And if these older people aren't seeing children, the other side of that coin is the children are not seeing older people either. <laughs> That's right. So if you don't get used to seeing older people, they don't exist. That's right. And, but uh, I think of another interesting angle on what you yeah. said about Yeah, and that's it. why, again, with the, uh, with the family, making sure your children see their grandparents very often, no matter, you know, what, how much that uh, entails. The trouble is, is uh, of the logistics is certainly worthwhile um, because, uh, again, if, if you never see someone and you don't learn to love them and you have no contact with them, when someone says, well, it's time for your grandpa to check out, well, who's that? Who's, who's going to defend and, and fight for someone that they never even saw before? Talk, oh, I remember one of the phrases. Um, this is, again, so many of these things. You only have to hear them once, and they, they stick in your mind. Yes. They're, they're so <laughs> jarring. Yeah. Was this, uh, we've already discussed um, sex without reproduction. Mm -hmm. Then he also said the technology would be there for reproduction without sex. Right. And this seems to me, this is a whole... This is a whole nother area because one of the, uh, you know, with, um, again, 
contradictory things occurring because you would think, well, if, if, a, if a land is over, so-called overpopulated, then you would want to diminish sexual activity or, you know, you'd want to get rid of pornography, you want to get everything that was sexually stimulating. But no, it, it's just the contrary. You want to increase sexual activity, but only insofar as it doesn't lead to reproduction. Right, right. That was the message, right? That, you know, that leads, and this is my own extension, he didn't say that, but that leads to slavery because if you become enslaved to your gratification, whether it's sex food or whatever, then you're more easily controlled, which is one of the uh, reasons uh, the celibate priesthood is so important. And so many priests don't even understand that. But uh, if you're addicted to sex, uh, well, you know, if sex is just divorced from reproduction, sex is something that you do for gratification only. Um, I won't try to parallel with food because you, you can't go without food. Uh, then you're, you can be more easily controlled by the availability or the removal of the availability of so, um, so that can become a, an enslaving feature. Now, uh, reproduction without sex, um, what you would get then is a product which has all the desirable attributes of a human being without any claim to human rights. The way we do it now, you say, well, you're human because you have a father and a mother and you have a grandfather and uncle friend and a family, so you're a human being, you have human rights. But if your father was a petri dish and your mother was a dust tube, uh, how can you lay claim to human rights? So Not too much warm there, is there? You owe your existence to the laboratory, which uh, conveys to you no human rights. And there's no God, so you can't go for any God-given human rights. So you're an ideal slave. You have all the attributes of a human being, but you don't have to any claim on rights. Mm -hmm. Well, in, uh, in Brave New World, if you remember, they had this the caste system, you know, the alphas, the omegas, and so forth. Yeah. And the lowest caste, well, the way they um, they brought about the different caste systems in was that in the uh, decanting room or the birthing room, uh, the individual who was to be, let's say, um, to do menial labor or slave labor work in the mines, they received just a little bit of oxygen to the brain so that they learned to love their slavery and they were very happy because they didn't know any better. They didn't have the, uh, the, the, the brains or the wherewithal to, uh, uh, to do things. But of course, the higher in the caste you got, uh, the more oxygen was uh, you know, given to your, your brain. So we actually had a group of, of sub-human beings mm -hmm. um, you know, who would um, be at the, um, as you say, a slave. Essentially, and uh, but they would love their slavery. Mm -hmm. See, in the past, slaves probably haven't loved their slavery very much. Yeah. But in this case, uh, we have this technology which will make people love their slavery. And each caste loved being what they were in Brave New World. Yeah. And any of my listeners who hasn't read that recently, I think you read it recently again, didn't you? Yeah. Or read it for the first time? Yeah, I read it it's phenomenal, time. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, I don't remember. Uh, you may remember the wording of the slogan that was about the Nazi concentration camps. Uh, something about work is peace and work is happiness. Uh, I don't remember whether it was Buchenwald or Auschwitz or one of them that had this sign about it. Mm -hmm. uh, your, my recollection of the words is imprecise, but the idea is what counts. And here's Huxley writing Brave New World saying basically the same thing before Hitler even uh, was in power. Oh, yeah. So Huxley uh, <laughs> knew something, didn't he? Yeah, well, of course, he came from a family that probably uh, um, contributed at least in part to this, this New World Order. Uh, uh, a number of the English authors, H.G. Wells, has a, has been, there are a number of books um, uh, from that period, and I think also from the, uh, the, uh, those associations, who highlighted uh, uh, at least concepts of you know what was coming down the uh, down the path, mm -hmm. and um, when we reading, um, I read uh, Brave New World when I was in like high school and reading it, uh, 
30 years later. I can remember reading it in high school. I thought, boy, is this fantasy land. And sure. I'm reading it <laughs> 30 years later, and I said, this is scary. This is reality. This is too this close is to fantasy. comfort. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and then after I thought about it, I wasn't sure whether Huxley wrote it. You know, it, there seems to be some type of, of, of the similar thinking between uh, his writings and then the, these, uh, this talk given by uh, Dr. Day, because you get a, a kind of a mix, mixed message in Brave New World that these things are not really quite good. It would be better if man still had a sense of humor, if he still had a sense of privacy, if, if um, you know, uh, certain things, the family still existed. But it's, an, it's inevitable. They're, they're going to go, too bad, you know, I feel a little sorry about that, a little sentiment, but... Um, the, the new order has to come in, and, and we're going to have to make room for it. And uh, and I got that same impression from the things that have been said about this, this day tape. There seemed to be a, you know, he wasn't real happy about some of the things, but then, you know, they're going to occur anyway, and, and you know, make it easier on yourself. The easier you, you know, more you accept it, the easier it's going to be for everyone around. And I'm kind of doing you a favor. That's you physicians out there this evening, I'm going to make it easier for you by telling you in advance what's coming, and you can make your own adjustments. Is that Somewhere in Scripture, uh, I think it's after the flood, uh, God said, I will write my law on men's hearts. And uh, I, I feel the same parallel that, that you drew between uh, Dr. Day's reaction to what he was exposed to and mine. Seeming not totally accepting of this, and actually seeming not totally accepting of what he wrote down, but both saying, well, there's a certain inevitability to all of this, and so, uh, you know, let's try to talk about the best parts of it. It's going to be good for people. Technology will be better. Quality of life will be better. So you live a few years shorter. Uh, uh, but they, uh, they both do seem to send out messages of what? Buying the whole package. And, I think and maybe wishing some people would ask more questions. You yeah. know, this this business. Well, you know, many. You know, looking looking back over history, there there are many leaders or um, individuals who thought, well, you know, they had a they had an idea of, of what a new world order should be. Uh, certainly, Hitler did. Uh, some, um, but what was lacking during these periods is that they lacked lack the really the technology to carry many of many of the things out surveillance um, constant monitoring uh, but in the in the so-called new world order it's going to be very difficult to escape because technology will provide those means which had been lacking those uh, totalitarian minded individuals from years ago I right I can't remember on the original tapes, did I mention the phrase where he said, this time we're going to do it right? No, he didn't. Oh, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> there's, there's so many details to get in, but that's, when, when he mentioned bringing in the New World Order, he said, this time we're going to do it right. And right away I'm going to What do you well, mean, well, this time? <laughs> what do you mean, this time? Well, we're Have we done it before? Time. What? And uh, uh, this was, there was no explicit explanation of that, but I think it's fairly easy to infer that the previous efforts had to do with Third Reich and, and communism and uh, everything going back to the French Revolution. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and the, your point about the technology you know, is is critical. Uh, with computers and all means of exchange being controlled by electronic impulses, nobody has any wealth. You own nothing of value except access to electronic impulses, which are beyond your own control. Um, a cashless society? A cashless society. So when your reward for working is uh, so many impulses on the, uh, on the computer, and then you go to the checkout or the furniture store or the clothing store and you buy and you, uh, in exchange you give so many electronic impulses, so, uh, the only claim you have is to these impulses, and you know, the people that run the system can give or take them to the computers. Up until this time, there was no way this statement in the book of Revelation that said, no man can buy or sell unless he has a market vision. There's no way that could be enforced. People could say, hey, I'll trade a bushel of tomatoes for a bushel of wheat. 
if you ride my kids to school, I'll give you six years of corn. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, bartering. bartering, right. Uh, and even not going necessarily to I mean, there's always gold and silver and other forms of money that were even better than bartering. But with this cashless society, this is the first time, I believe, in the history of the human race where the entire population of the world can be controlled economically so that somebody can say, I know I'm pushing the right buttons, I know how much credit you have electronically, I know where you spend your money electronically, and you cannot buy, you cannot sell unless you get on my computer. Uh, right now you have a half a dozen credit cards in your pocket, but pretty soon they'll be narrowed into one credit card, and then one week. The ostensible reason is people lose their credit cards, and we have to get rid of that and put the implant in. That's right. <laughs> and uh, where can you put the implant? In, on your hand or on your forehead? Where it has to be accessible to the skin. So yeah. your right hand or your forehead. Speaking of scanner, um, when the uh, we had the, the TV war, the Gulf War, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, the first war you just sit there and 24 hours a day, just just by being on the battlefield there. But there was uh, several points made about the advances in technology um, and how they could spot just one little individual down in, in you know, uh, I mean, they could pin, they used the constant reference to pinpoint, pinpoint, pinpoint. pinpoint. Well, I imagine that with these, um, the, uh, the different uh, technologies, they could also pinpoint a couple of renegades in the New World Order. I mean, oh, yeah. that what was the technology was, which was applicable to a so-called enemy can also be applicable to the controlling the order, you know, with. Exactly, you know, um, it, it's infrared stuff that is uh, um, sort of amateurish about this. But any heat source, like a, a deer or a human being, a renegade, uh, uh, can be picked up by an infrared scanner, and you get sort of an outline of whether it's a deer or a sheep or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, these, my first hearing about them was uh, in the Vietnam War, where our troops used them to detect the enemy. Now that's what, uh, 20 some years ago. So they're probably even more sophisticated now than they were then. But uh, with this kind of uh, surveillance, uh, it'd be pretty hard for anybody to escape and say, well, I'm just gonna go off into the mountains and be a hermit and escape the New World Order. I can shoot deer and eat berries and survive. And uh, I've got a wife who's pretty sturdy. And she'll be able to survive. And, We'll do what the Indians did uh, before Columbus got here, and we'll all survive. It's a new world order. Say no, you won't. Because, uh, we're going to find you. Yeah, well, even in Brave New World, the, they have a, they had a group of uh, people who still lived as a family, and the women breastfed, and of course they were called the savages. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. yeah. We won't have any savages. We'll all be we'll cultured. We'll be thin, and our teeth will be straight. And something also that was mentioned: uh, forest could and, if necessary, would be leveled or burned. Now this comes out of the, you know, this overall movement about goddess Mother Earth and how we have to protect the ecology. Oh, yes, the environmental movement, right. But the environmental the movement is <laughs> all expensive. If we want to get a, uh, somebody who's trying to get away, we'll burn down the whole forest, we'll find them. Uh, that was stated, mm -hmm. that, that uh, uh, deforestation would and could be brought about if necessary to be sure that nobody gets outside the uh, control of the system. Well, we're just about uh, drawing to a close here. Um, how did you feel after, uh, well, let's see, it's been about, what, 22 years now since yes. that original lecture, and it probably isn't a day that goes by, at least since I've heard the tape, that I don't think about the things that this Dr. Day said. He gives constant reminders. Not a day goes by. Something doesn't say, that reminds me of such and such. Whether it's uh, surveillance or security, you know, somebody selling security system, you get a house from me. Or clothing, clothing. or uh, I opened up a toy catalog uh, 
the other day and, and I noticed that there didn't happen to be any baby dolls in the, in the, the toy catalog. Of course, uh, you know, going back to the idea we don't want little girls to be thinking about babies. They, they only had one little doll and it was kind of an adult doll and nothing that would uh, raise anyone's maternal instinct um, for their um, well, Doc, what's the, what's the prognosis? Well, left to man alone, I think the, the technology is already here, um, and with technological progress, I think it is inevitable if man is left to his devices, that some men will be able to assert total control over other Men, other people. Uh, man left to his own devices. The, the tendency is in groups like this then for internal dissension to arise, where they would the leaders uh, would be at each other's throats too. Each say, "No, I'm I'm more powerful than you. I deserve more than you." Who will control the controllers? Yeah, they, they would have themselves. I think uh, so that they, they would create. Uh, you know, the seeds of their own destruction while they're creating the system. But the other thing, I wonder if in, indeed this uh, may be time for a war to come back and say enough's enough. If, uh, because you're going to destroy my planet Earth, and I am in charge of the planet. I'm in charge of mankind. Mankind will be destroyed or whatever if I say. <clears throat> I'm not allowing my creatures to assume and assert this degree of control where you're going to destroy the whole planet. I was thinking as you was just saying that is that um, in past dictators could kill people, they could torture them, but essentially they could not change what it meant to be a human being. They could not change human nature. Yeah. Now we are going to have with this, you know, the new genome project, the multi-billion dollar project where they're going to be getting a tab on everyone's genes. No one shall escape. Everyone shall have their genetic codes uh, and all this. And with this opens the door to, to manipulation to change the very meaning of what it means to be human. Yeah. And one then, if one, if one has an entity then that no longer has free will, um, you just have to wonder, at that point, our Lord says, enough. Just as Lucifer set himself up as God in the beginning, some people now would set themselves up as God and say, I control the computers, I control the genomes, I control them, I am God. And at that, that point, then he would have to say, No, you're not. <laughs> I have to demonstrate to you, you're not. <laughs> I'm still God. You're just a creature. Yeah. And as you said on the original tape, um, we believe in, in what our Lord has said in the sense that he will not leave us orphans, that, you know, he will be I, with us to the end of time. This right away now begs the question when they come around and say, it's your turn to sign the allegiance form. What are you going to do? When Henry VIII came around, he said, uh, well, you either sign here and join, or, uh, and while, while he's telling you this, they're throwing the noose over the, <laughs> the limb of the oak tree and uh, they're saying, uh, slipping the noose around your neck and saying, you want to sign this or do we slap the worst out from any of them? A lot of people said, I won't sign it, and, and they were murdered. Um, despite uh, his having said there will be no martyrs, certainly there will be martyrs. <coughs> and the implication of his statement was, that, well, they will not be recognized as martyrs. But uh, there will be martyrs, and they will be recognized as martyrs. And, uh, maybe uh, not in the same way as in the past, but uh, I think this is something that maybe uh, all people need to sort of prepare themselves for. When I'm nose to nose with this choice, are you going to sign this allegiance or not, or we're going to put you in a box car and you're going out to Arizona mm -hmm. in the desert, people yeah. have to be prepared to make a decision. And I think it would be an understatement uh, not to say or to say that this really, this, this uh, tape has um, great meaning and um, it, uh, it, it's just like a, a, a forewarning and uh, it gives us ideas of things we should do and things we shouldn't do 
And I think everyone listening to the tape will come up with different things that he can do on a small scale. I think that's the beauty of this thing. It's not, you know, as he was talking, it wasn't like real earth-shattering things that he was talking about. He was talking about little things, uh, television, things that we do every day, things that are under our control, mm -hmm. the books we read. Uh, you know, and I think uh, probably some of these changes, if they're going to occur, will occur with the individual person within the, that family, that, that um, uh, with, with, you know, him getting the word out and, uh, and then doing the little things. I think they matter over the long haul the most. Just as with the prisoners who survived the brainwashing, I think people who are spiritually oriented, who are thinking about God, thinking about uh, their relationship with God, are the ones who will then be better prepared, very equipped to survive uh, this world and the next. <laughs> uh, whereas those who are just focused on uh, meeting their needs right now, uh, you know, strictly the material needs of the day, uh, they're more easily uh, controlled. Under the threat of losing your comfort or losing your food or losing your head or whatever, uh, you know, certainly some people are going to yield, and those who I think will will survive, and I, I really mean in both this life and the next, uh, they're going to be the ones who are going to have to be prepared because it's my belief when the time comes to make the decision, you're going to sign on or you're not going to sign on. It's too late to begin the preparation. Of Saying, well, let me think about it. Yeah. You don't have time to think about it. You're going to either say yes or no. I hope the lot of us make the right decision. <laughs> I do so too, and I think the um, uh, I think the tape will uh, will change as uh, as many lives and and have hopefully as good an effect as it had had on mine and on yours. So let me thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. For further information. Please contact the U.S. Coalition for Life, Box 315, Export, Pennsylvania, 15632. Your comments and criticisms and any other information which you might have regarding this tape will be most welcome. Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and bringing you the story behind the story, the news behind the news, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at and illusion is usually king. But in the battle for survival of Western civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that's going to determine just what the future will bring. Now, I want to introduce to you uh, Dr. Lawrence Dunnigan. And Dr. Dunnigan is a pediatrician. He, practiced in Pittsburgh. he practices in the eastern part of the United States. And uh, he's been practicing for 30 years. Uh, but some 28 years ago, he heard a fascinating lecture uh, given by uh, Dr. Day, uh, who had been a professor at uh, the medical school he had attended. And this uh, talk was given to a, a group of young doctors with the proviso that nobody would take notes and nobody would record what was said. Dr. Day then went on to become a director of the Planned Parenthood Federation. So uh, right now, let's um, uh, introduce Dr. Dunnigan. Dr. Dunnigan, it's so good for you to, to be with us or to have you with us today. Oh, my pleasure. All right, fine. Well, why don't you just uh, give our listeners the background of this incredible, incredible story you heard 28 years ago, which is so prophetic as far uh, as what's unfolding today. And let me just, uh, for the listener, uh, comment that one of the things that uh, was said 28 years ago was we would have sex without reproduction and reproduction without sex. Yeah. And as we begin thinking about the artificial insemination and now the new cloning process, you realize that what was said 28 years ago uh, to a young pediatrician uh, is all coming to pass today, a part of a long-range plan of, of a group of men who do have an agenda. So why don't you pick up the story from there? Well, when we sat down to listen to the lecture, uh, we were all expecting something clinical. Uh, Dr. Day, uh, his areas of uh, primary uh, research concern had always been newborn, premature birth, um, and the problems with uh, uh, carnicterous uh, 
coming from neonatal jaundice and temperature control in uh, premature babies. So we, we were all expecting something scientific, and uh, as the presentation unfolded, it was uh, quite a surprise uh, because there was nothing scientific. It was all what we might call sociologic. Um, and as you alluded a while ago, uh, Dr. Day had indicated that he wanted to see nobody taking notes or using a tape recorder because the uh, things he was going to talk about, uh, actually he said in the process, if you ever quote me on these things, I will deny them. He seemed to be indicating that uh, there could be some sort of physical danger to him uh, for speaking out about such things. Uh, that was more a suggested, I think, uh, rather than an explicit statement. But, um, you know, when you hear that sort of thing very early in a, uh, what you're anticipating to be a scientific presentation, uh, that really caught my attention. You know, what are you going to be telling us that uh, could put you in some danger one way or another? So, uh, anyway, as the uh, presentation unfolded, uh, a began by stating that uh, anybody with uh, an eighth grade education could do the arithmetic and determine that uh, the earth would soon be overpopulated if there were no limits put on human reproduction. Um, and part and parcel of the overpopulation then would be outgrowing our natural resources and over pollution of the planet. These people always refer to the world or the earth as the planet. So um, in the beginning it seemed as though the presentation was almost an apology for things that we would in the audience find unpalatable, but there were several times in the presentation where he would say, this is the only way. There's no other way. Um, this is sort of uh, implying that uh, he knew these things would uh, maybe not sound acceptable to many, if not all, in the audience. So the uh, thing that he, really this whole thing hung on was population control. And uh, up until that time, uh, I had heard, most of us had heard that term, population control. Uh, to me, it primarily meant limiting births. Uh, by the end of the presentation, I realized that population control has a much, much broader meaning than uh, just limiting a uh, number of births and even who or who may not be allowed to give birth because the presentation covered just every human endeavor, uh, education, employment, industry, entertainment, sports, uh, toys for children, clothing, a whole bunch of things that maybe we can get into as we go on here as, as time allows. But um, mentioning, as you did, uh, sex without reproduction and reproduction without sex, that was a, an important part of this. Uh, also, uh, money and banking, uh, which was toward the end of his presentation. Um, the cashless society moved from uh, cash to uh, credit cards to a single credit card to a single identifying card, and then ultimately uh, at the end, uh, because cards can be lost or stolen, uh, some sort of implant under the skin. In those days, silicone implants were uh, under the very first stages of development. Silicone is uh, inert, so the body tends to uh, tolerate it fairly well. Um, and this implant then uh, would serve as identification um, and be an element in uh, carrying on commerce, which, uh, as I say, would replace cash, replace checks from a checking account, replace plastic uh, credit cards, which 
back at that time were starting to really accelerate in use um, so that um, all of these items that serve your, your uh, financial banking needs also would serve for identification and um, this could be implanted. <laughs> I'm laughing because at the time he said, uh, some of you hearing this will uh, right away think there's a religious connotation here. Um, and at that time, I had no idea what he's referring to. I was not uh, much of a Bible scholar. And then it was only later that I read the book of the Apocalypse uh, about the, uh, uh, the mark of the beast on the hand of the forehead. And I made the connection, and I realized why he said what he said. Uh, did he tell you what the relationship was to banking and uh, international finance, or was this just uh, a casual remark about the fact that we would progress to uh, a situation or a society where everybody would be marked and identified? Um, yeah, he went... Uh, the presentation was that... Um, the changes that he was projecting from then, 1969, the target date to have them all in place was the turn of the century. The year 2000, right. Uh, it would take a few years according to how well it would progress, but that was where they were shooting. And this was uh, worldwide, not just the United States or not just uh, United States, Europe, and you know, so-called Western civilization. But this was to be uh, global, the entire world. Now, did he tell you who was going to be doing it, or was it just it's, it's going to happen and, and there's some group behind this? Uh, it's going to happen. There, he never used a proper noun. He used only one proper noun in the entire presentation. Uh, that it was the Rockefeller Institute. Now, what was the tie of the Rockefeller Institute into this? Now, did he say? Um, that had to do with... Uh, research and uh, the treatment of cancer. And there was something about they had treatments for cancer, but they didn't want to release them because uh, we had to have people dying off. What was that? Yes, that's uh, just about what it was, that uh, uh, many or most cancers now c could be cured. Now, this is back in 1969. Uh, many or most cancers now are curable, but the, uh, the information has been held in uh, Rockefeller Institute files because imagine what would happen if people stopped dying of cancer. And of course that's exactly what Thomas Malthus wrote about back in 1800. You know, we had to have people dying so we could have new people born. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, okay, well just, I, I pardon me for interrupting you, but I just wanted to bring that fact out. So uh, this is 28 years ago. You're hearing the predictions of what the future holds uh, uh -huh. for the world. So why don't you pick it up from there? Well, um, I'm, I'm just trying to recall where he started. There was uh, this general overview about controlling births, uh, who may or may not be allowed to have birth, implying that uh, certain people would be not allowed to have children. Uh, most people would be allowed to. Uh, exceptional people might be allowed three, but uh, never more than that. The replacement statistic that is widely quoted is 2.1 births per couple. The point one meaning, uh, you know, two, two would replace the two parents, and then the point one is because of some untimely deaths of disease or accident or whatever, so replacement levels felt to be just a little above two. Um, in that context, too, he mentioned that um, something we feel that we can accelerate and control evolution. And this was in a context of uh, controlling who might be allowed to uh, reproduce. In other words, if your genes were acceptable, uh, you would be allowed to bear children. But if they were not, uh, you might be forbidden to bear children. Um, that's when the, the business about sex without babies and babies without sex uh, got some development uh, in that uh, 
certain people who had desirable genetic characteristics that should be perpetuated for the good of the world uh, could be would be encouraged to reproduce but they need not reproduce in the in the natural way through sexual intercourse but uh, this could be all done in the laboratory um, and along those lines uh, the question which he anticipated by the way I should say we, there was no opportunity for any of us in the audience to uh, ask any questions but um, because the uh, sexual instincts are so strong he said you might think that uh, at first we would try to uh, de-emphasize sex but um, that's nearly impossible to do because the uh, feelings are so strong so the plan is to go the other way to uh, encourage sexual activity uh, uh, promote sexual desire but do it in such a way that it's directed away from uh, reproduction and um, part and parcel of that then was uh, the promotion of uh, uh, contraceptive devices uh, they would be promoted in such a way that it would be just instinctive uh, natural that when you were thinking about sex you would automatically connect it to uh, contraception that uh, sex without contraception would be uh, sort of a deliberate mental process but most sexual activity would uh, be linked to contraception now, how do you do that? Well, um, sex education in the schools. And was, was he talking about sex education and its importance back there in 1969? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he developed that uh, to some extent, uh, that this would be taught in the schools. Uh, kids would be taught. Uh, see, the, uh, the birth control pill was, it was 69. Um, the birth control pill came in about... It was around in the early 60s, wasn't it? Mid 60s? Yeah, early to middle 60s. Right. And uh, so that, this was all fairly, uh, fairly new stuff. And it, of course, he talked about things that had been around a while, too condoms and diaphragms. But that this would be taught in the schools, the use of these. I remember that uh, particularly because as he was saying this, I was recalling some of my teachers from high school. Uh, and say, oh, I can remember Miss So and So, but <laughs> you know, she would never, never uh, feel that she could talk about these things. Of course, th I was thinking of one of my algebra teachers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was talking about uh, something entirely different. But you know, that was a connection I made in my mind that uh, in my high school, this uh, never would have gone off the ground. Now you were t uh, frantically taking notes all during this uh, uh, lecture on napkins that you had, uh, and uh, so that uh, nobody would really realize you were taking notes because you'd been asked not to. But you sensed that this was important, so you were recording this for posterity at the time. Yes, uh, many of the things that he said I had heard before from. Uh, other sources, primarily one source, which I considered to be unreliable. And uh, I'd heard it at length uh, with some repetition to the point where actually it actually became annoying to me. And um, I dismissed it because I considered the source uh, not reliable. And here, then it was a few years later, see, the, the first I'd heard it was uh, from this viewpoint. I stand out here seeing over there that there's a conspiracy going on. Uh, it's very broad-based, it's very pervasive, it's very subtle, nobody knows it. And only uh, a few of us who are able to see this know what's going on. Well, I, I dismissed that. Well, then here in 1969, I heard from the other end, uh, I'm part of it. I know what's going on. I've been told what's going on. I've been privy to... Uh, certain privileged information and here it is <laughs> so you know hearing all this stuff from a different perspective I'm not an outsider looking in I'm an insider speaking out the window to you uh, believe me that had quite an impact so that uh, 
most of the things he said I, I had heard before. And then as the talk unfolded, and uh, quite frankly was offensive in many ways to me, um, it wasn't things that I was hearing for the first time, but rather confirming some things that I had heard before. Like the relocation of industries, uh, breaking down our armed forces, um, shipping our jobs overseas so that uh, unemployment would go up. Uh, those were some that, that I'd heard before and would not believe. Uh, but, uh, of course, one of the things he talked about was how we were going to encourage people to buy foreign products because uh, we were intentionally going to produce shabby cars in America so that people would buy Japanese. And of course, in 1969, that, most people would have thought that was crazy talk. But what did he say along that line uh, with the idea that this would then justify the shifting of American industries to foreign countries? Yeah, this was to establish the global economy. The idea would be we would have one global, worldwide commercial system. Um, it wasn't his term originally, but he alluded to what they call uh, the Declaration of Interdependence. I think it was Buckminster Fuller who wrote that. It's sort of a parody or takeoff on a Jefferson's Declaration of Independence for our country. And... Um, been a while since I've read that, but the opening sentences of the Declaration of Interdependence are an echo of uh, our Declaration of Independence. And the idea is that uh, every part of the world should be uh, involved in a single economy with different parts of the world having emphasis on different aspects of a global economy. And the United States was to be the information center. Our smokestack industries were to be uh, sent to other countries. Um, and did he explain how that would come about? Just that the, the people who make the decisions, the uh, captains of industry and uh, politicians would get together and decide, uh, we'll close a steel mill here and reopen it there. Um, now, what was this about building in obsolescence to American cars uh, so that they'd break down and people would become disillusioned uh, with our vehicles and buy Japanese? Yes, the idea was to promote uh, specifically the Japanese auto industry. Uh, this was a principle that was applied other ways, but they, they wanted to um, build up the hard industries in Japan and not eliminate ours, but de-emphasize them. So that uh, the way to do this was uh, if you bought uh, an American-built car and the door handle kept coming off or the window <laughs> crank would fall off or some piece under the hood that sh should have been made of metal was made of plastic and it would crack. And uh, you would become irritated by that. And then your neighbor who had a Japanese car would say, well, I've driven this for so many years and so many uh thousands of miles and all I do is change the oil in the tires. Well, and did Dr. Day actually talk about this? Well, uh, yeah, he said th this was in the plans. Th this was the long-range plan uh, as of 28 years ago yeah. uh, to begin uh, orienting Americans towards buying foreign products by intentionally creating inferior products in America. I know my wife was saying the other day that she doesn't hate to buy anything uh, clothing made in America because it just falls apart, you know. Uh, the, the threads come out, the buttons pop off, and, uh, you know, of course, she attributed this just to, uh, you know, accidental shoddy workmanship, but... Uh, uh, you're suggesting that maybe there is a, a plan, uh, at least as far as certain of our products, uh, to discourage Americans from buying them uh, to actually uh, buy them overseas, thus transferring America's wealth, industry, uh, and production to other nations as we uh, then lose jobs here in America? Right, right. I remember this particularly because, as a matter of fact, I probably was laughing to myself, as I do now when I recall it. Uh, thinking this, they could never get away with this. Well, I was a child during World War II, and I remember that uh, we always laughed at things that were stamped made in Japan. Right, I remember that too. Uh, and we were very proud that American-made goods were uh, more reliable and more enduring. Uh, 
And so this was a complete about face. That which was made in Japan now was going to be the superior product and ours the inferior product. And uh, part of the idea behind this was a psychological preparation that uh, the there's sort of a, should we say, patriotism. You know, things that are made in my hometown are the best. Things that are made in my state are the best. Things that are made in America are the best because we're the best country in the world. And they were trying to destroy that belief? Yes, yes. So that you would say, well, um, I might be a patriotic American, but, uh, gee, I can't afford to be buying second-rate stuff when I can save money buying a foreign import. So patriotism would take a back seat to... Uh, economy, you know, to my personal economy, and this then would break down the kind of uh, loyalty to your locale or to your nation and foster a uh, more cosmopolitan citizen of the world attitude. Destroy the love of country. Uh -huh. Okay, fine. I think that's such a fascinating insight into the mentality uh, of these people who uh, seem to uh, have such tremendous power uh, over education, over industry, or even over our uh, ways of reproduction today. Well, what other sorts of things did they talk about? I remember one thing that you mentioned was how they were going to encourage uh, sexuality and uh, if they were going to try to get people's minds oriented on this sexuality. Did they talk at all about homosexuality and, and how that would be used? Yeah, um, that would be promoted, uh, not just merely tolerated or, or permitted, but actually to be promoted, the idea uh, being that no child ever results from a homosexual union. Um, the business of uh, morality, especially a religious-based morality, uh, really would have no part in, uh, in this future. <laughs> which is the present now. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's almost, uh, you'd laugh because it's so ridiculous what has transpired, and uh, uh, you either laugh or you cry. Well, you know, it, between then and now, it's been uh, quite an experience to watch this unfold right according to the script. Right. Uh, the unfolding nightmare is uh, the moral foundations of our once great uh, Christian society are, are progressively undermined. Consider this. If um, we're going to have babies without sex and sex without babies, then for a large part, we interchange the section, sexes. Uh, there's no real difference between men and women. Uh, did, he, did he stress that, uh, how we were going to feminize men and masculinize women? Uh, he more stressed masculinizing the women than he did feminizing the men. And uh, this would start in youth, for example... One of the things he mentioned was uh, that toys that were available for children would be changed. Uh, girls would get footballs and soccer balls, and uh, baby dolls and tea sets, uh, you know, little domestic kits like a dustpan and broom. Uh, some of that would disappear entirely, and other things like that would be uh, very, very greatly de-emphasized. <coughs> In other words, trying to undermine the maternal or uh, these rather normal I instincts that women have for uh, being housekeepers uh, to get them more out into the uh, labor market. and uh, Yes, yes, exactly. And certainly if they're out in the labor market, they're not going to be having children. That's right. Uh, if mom's at home and she's enjoying her first and second baby, she's likely to say, well, it's time for a third and fourth. Right. And I can take care of these kids. So because my hubby's uh, making a reasonable living and uh, we can support them. And of course now you can't, you have to have the woman working uh, because of the tax system and because of uh, the actual, not in dollar amount, but in purchasing amount decrease in the wages uh, of the average American working male. Yes, yes. Yeah, the term they use is discretionary spending. And your discretionary spending, of course you lose all discretion because the tax, tax collector <laughs> takes it. And so you're... Uh, you're just trying to survive. And then um, if mom has one or two children that she worries about while she's at work, uh, that's enough worry for her. 
So she's not going to say, well, I'm going to keep my full-time career and have more children. You know, that uh, just gets too much to, to be uh, concerned about. Take, worrying about daycare, getting somebody to take care of the children. And so what we're really talking about is an organized plan of social engineering laid out many, many decades ago uh, that is coming to fruition uh, really in the, in the intervening decades. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, one other thing you, uh, I wanted to develop a little bit, and then we could go on, and that's the, about the promoting of sexual activity. Okay. Um, in 1969, abortion was a crime in every one of the states. And uh, at that time, he said, well, it won't be long until abortion not only is no longer a crime, but will be seen as uh, a right and uh, be tax-supported, uh, which at that time sounded incredible. By promoting sexual activity among youngsters and linking it strongly to contraception, um, Planners realized that uh, more pregnancies would occur. The um, idea then was, that's okay. If there are more pregnancies that occur, we'll have an abortion backup. And people who would otherwise oppose abortion will change their mind when they say, well, this is my daughter who's pregnant at a young and tender age. And abortion restrictions might be okay for everybody else. So you were saying how they were going to change our attitude towards abortion, and how uh, in uh, in 1969 uh, abortion was illegal uh, in every state. So what did they plan? How were they going to change that? Well, the idea is to promote early sexual activity among the kids. Um, connecting it strongly with the use of contraceptives. They would be taught that the two just naturally should go together. And then with the realization that with more sexual activity, there would be more pregnancies, more contraceptive failures, one might say. Um, but no need to worry about cluttering up the planet with unwanted babies because abortion then would be available uh, as a backup. And with young girls uh, getting pregnant uh, too early in their life, people who otherwise would uh, maybe object to abortion when, you know, if it was in somebody else's life, would say, well, yeah, but uh, I no longer object because this is my daughter and uh, I don't want her to have to carry this pregnancy to term because she's not yet mature enough to, uh, to be a mother and take care of a baby. So it, it was sort of a win-win situation for them. Um, it would break down uh, resistance to abortion as well as reinforcing continually the, uh, the need for contraception or <laughs> sex without babies. Uh, you know, uh, as you talk about this, it sounds so diabolical, almost like the plan had come right out of the pit of hell. Yes. <laughs> I think so. I well, think so. And so looking back on this, as you've seen it unfolding over the last 29 years or 28 years, it must have been terribly, terribly frustrating for you uh, uh, seeing these things and uh, knowing what was going on and yet realizing that the vast majority of the American people uh, had no idea at all what was transpiring. What was frustrating, and even talking with some of my colleagues who heard the same presentation, and not very long afterwards, they had all seemed to forget it. Uh, they'd say, oh, yeah, I remember he was here, and I remember he talked about some stuff. But as far as details and saying, well, don't you remember when he said this, that, and the other? Um, uh, they'd say, no, did he say that? Well, I don't know. Like, uh, when I say that, what comes to mind is uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Day had spoken about the demise pill. Um, the demise pill... There, there was consideration to be given to an arbitrary age after which, you know, everybody should just pass on. Now, the age could be set by law, 75, 80, 85, whatever uh, seemed to be appropriate at the time, and then when you reach that age, 
uh, you would be a candidate to take the demise bill. And he said this uh, attitudes about death needed to be changed and made more, quote, realistic. So, uh, you know, we're all headed for death one way or another, so why not do this in a very cerebral, scientific kind of way? Uh, so the uh, idea was that uh, when you had reached the legal age, you could have this nice banquet, sort of a farewell banquet with your family and friends, and afterwards uh, go off and take your demise pill and sleep away peacefully. <laughs> One of my colleagues, who had, we were uh, outside a, a meeting in the hospital, and there was some talk about, uh, he was having some pain, he was coming into the hospital uh, to get some tests and maybe have some surgery. <laughs> I said, well, hey, Fred, what are you going to do at night? You know, the night before the operation, maybe you're a little restless and you can't sleep. And the nurse comes in and says, well, here's your sleeping pill. <laughs> are you going to take it? <laughs> if you take it, maybe they won't have to do the operation. <laughs> he just laughed. And he, uh, he said, uh, did he say that? I didn't remember that. And I said, yeah, you better remember he said it. And so they were, even back in 1969, they were talking about a more or less coerced or forced uh, euthanasia. Uh, yeah. uh, did they talk at all about uh, other countries, how they were going to control population uh, in other countries, or uh, poss the possibility of fomenting disease to control uh, a population? Yes. Um. There, there were there were a couple of things there. One, uh, there was a part of the presentation where he said new diseases will appear. Um, they will be very difficult to diagnose. Uh, the doctors seeing these for the first time, of course, will not know what's going on. Uh, and the reason I remember this so strongly was I was fairly new in practice. And after hearing him talk about new diseases that would appear, I'd have a youngster in the office and be examining him, and I'd, you know, I'd say, gee, he's got this fever and these symptoms, and it just doesn't add up. I wasn't you know, absolutely certain what was going on. Well, right away, my memory would ring a bell and say, could this be one of those new diseases he was talking about? Well, as it turned out, that, that was not the case in, in my practice or with any of my kids. But in uh, in retrospect, I think he was talking about AIDS. Um, there were some other things that were said that sort of lead me to that conclusion. Uh, what other things were there? Because, of course, my major interest has been the AIDS epidemic. I've been battling this for over uh -huh. a decade. So uh -huh. what, are, what other things were there that, uh, if you can recall, and I know this is a long time ago, yeah. uh, but I just thank the Lord that you took those notes and uh, on, the, on the napkins and then uh, re-recorded them. What other things did he say uh, that made, uh, makes you think that perhaps the AIDS epidemic has something to do with a, with a plan? The continent of Africa is a very rich continent. Now that's what he said. Well, I'm sort of paraphrasing. Okay, right, right. And I don't recall that this was in immediate juxtaposition to AIDS, uh, but it was pretty close. Okay, so of course the, the AIDS epidemic is simply uh, decimating, depopulating Africa. The American people don't know that, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it's really happening today. And, and so is he talking about possible disease, Africa, or just the fact that it was uh, such a rich, rich continent? Well, here we have a world that's soon to be overpopulated, soon to run out of natural resources, and here's this great big continent of Africa full of resources. Now, this continent should not be left to people who have never been able to develop it. Um, the continent should be under the control of people who know how to develop and manage all these resources. Um, and in effect, what, what that means is uh, you have to get rid of the people that are there now, not totally perhaps, but uh, in large part, to make room for the managers to move in. 
That's a frightening, frightening thing to contemplate, and yet that's exactly what is happening in Africa today. Mm -hmm. And the the interesting thing is that uh, it's always veiled under concern and love, and we're helping you out. Um, uh, you know, we love all our fellow men, but there were some comments about, let's face it, not all people are equal. We all know that. Some people are uh, uh, not as smart, not as uh, capable, and uh, capable of doing only menial tasks. And there were some uh, racial allusions there. Now, if you have a continent full of people that uh, are not capable of doing what Europeans are capable of doing, or Europeans who have become Americans are capable of doing, then you can't leave such a large, rich continent uh, under the control of people that can't manage it. And the ultimate in racism just hiding behind the, the banner of love and compassion. Mm hmm Yes. Yes. Okay, fine. So basically he was talking about, the, do, do you say these diseases would be produced? Where would they come from, uh, uh, these new diseases that were uh, going to come into society? That was not explicit at the time, as, as I recall it. I just, the, the best I can recall was that they would occur, but I kept wondering, am I going to miss them? Will, will I ever recognize them? Or even will I get them? Right. You know, would I myself succumb to, to something like this? Um, but in terms of how this would be brought about, I don't think that was addressed at all. Okay, so uh, we, we begin to see, though, uh, an active program, and not just sort of passively bringing about population control, but actively bringing about population control. Yeah. Uh, were there any other points that he made as far as population control is concerned? That you know, because these ideas are so foreign to uh, the average listener, uh, the idea that we would have a, a demise pill. In other words, we would kill older people, and uh, we would, in uh, uh, 1969, the idea that we would start aborting uh, the children of this country in mass numbers was, was so foreign. Uh, did he talk at all about uh, pushing abortion towards certain racial or ethnic groups? That sort of grew out of... Uh talking about promoting drug use? Uh, well, let's get into talking about promoting drug use because that is so important, uh, especially today when we see uh, drugs destroying the inner cities of America. Uh, not everybody deserves space on the planet. Not everybody deserves the right to marry and reproduce. Um, so certain people have to be sort of Shunted. Now, I don't mean individual selection where you identify a particular human being, but certain populations with certain group characteristics have to be shunted. Uh, now, part of this grows out of uh, transferring industry overseas. Uh, if uh, I, I thought in terms of our steel industry, where a lot of wage earners, you know, didn't have to have a lot of education, a lot of savvy to. Uh, do the work and earn a wage and raise a family. But when these industries are either closed or transferred, then the, uh, the wage earners uh, don't have any other, any place to go to earn money to uh, raise a family. Um, women, <laughs> this was an education, I, I, heard, I learned a whole lot there. He said, women are attracted to men who are good providers. See, when I was a kid, they, I thought they were attracted to Clark Gable and the <laughs> good-looking movie star. And so this was a really a revelation at my age uh, at that time. Here, this women are attracted to men who are good providers. They don't much care what a man looks like. Whereas uh, men are more attracted to a woman by her appearance. And also, a man identifies himself by his work. Uh, and as I thought about what he said, uh, many times in the following years, I think that's absolutely correct. I'm Joe Blow. Uh, I'm a welder. I'm John Jones. I'm a stockbroker. 
you know, I, I think it's true. We do tend to identify ourselves that way. Well, if you have no job by which to identify yourself, you're not a good provider to attract a woman to become your wife, then you're not going to have as great an opportunity to bear children. Now, if you have a whole bunch of young men who are unemployed, are not good providers, uh, have no strong identity through their work, um, you know, what do these guys do when they get together? Well, there's a certain uh, homosexual promotion there and a certain, uh, you know, falling into crime. Sure. Which uh, I, I think is a natural consequence in which was recognized. Well, no, by, were you talking about crime or were you talking about drug use? Uh, well, where does drug use put into the, come into this whole situation? Okay. Now, if, if you're young and, and you have no job and you have no family, no responsibilities, and life is just a bore, then you're more vulnerable to abusing drugs. Now, did he suggest that they would encourage drug use? Yeah. Yes. Um, that is an incredible, incredible uh, uh, prediction uh, of what uh, the direction that these people that Dr. Day represented would be taking our society, because they had to have powerful uh, control or powerful influence over uh, uh, governmental uh, uh, positions and governmental activities. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was to create sort of neighborhoods, it uh, doesn't seem like the right word anymore, but certain areas of the cities that uh, would be the jungle. Um, we have progressed so far that the laws of natural selection no longer operate. This is sort of a near quote, paraphrasing. Uh, there was natural population control in previous years, predatory animals and wars and disease and such, but now that technology has uh, nullified a lot of that, uh, this is part of the problem of overpopulation. So, since the former law of the jungle no longer applies, we would now have a new law of the jungle, and the jungle would be uh, certain areas in primarily large metropolitan areas where uh, people just have no opportunity, no hope. Um, the areas would be allowed to deteriorate um, with the idea that um, as despair grew and uh, people sought refuge in drugs and alcohol, then a certain amount of violence would be predictable. And that's okay because that would, you know, if you die in 1969 because uh, somebody shot you, or if you died in uh, 1769 because a bear got you, a mountain lion got you, uh, what's the difference? You're dead in either case. You, you succumb to the law of the jungle. The survival of the fittest, on the other hand, means that uh, in a time when you had to be a crack shot with your musket and you got the mountain lion, uh, the only difference is that now instead of being a musketeer, now you're a computer genius. Those are the criteria by which uh, you select to survive. And now, of course, when Dr. Dave was making all of these predictions and telling you what the future held, uh, didn't he make some uh, reference to the fact that everything was in place, uh, that nothing would stop this at the present time, uh, and so he felt at least somewhat um, able to, to reveal these things to you? Yes. Yes, that was uh, fairly early in the presentation that that was said. Um, that was 69, and um, as best I can recall, there there was no nothing specified as exactly what was in place now that hadn't been. But he said something uh, that even as recently as five or ten years earlier, he could not have spoken with such assurance about what the future held. And of course, uh, he went on then to become some sort of an official with Planned Parenthood? He was, at the time when he spoke, he uh, he was medical director of uh, 
Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And he had been a professor at the Geer Medical School. And he was a very well-known uh, neonatologist. Yes. Yes, and then uh, he left here and uh, went to Planned Parenthood Federation in New York. Uh, became disillusioned there, and I'm not sure the nature of that disillusionment, whether it was uh, ideological or what, but uh, um, he did become disillusioned with them and left. Uh, and he's, he has subsequently died. He's passed away. Yes, yes. He died uh, mm, eight or roughly eight years ago. I'd, I'd have to look and see uh, my file. So he never saw his dream come to fruition, but uh, uh, certainly the people who are in, uh, in sympathy with these ideas are seeing it unfold today as America moves into chaos and crime and drugs and uh, new diseases uh, developing uh, all across America. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, as you look back on this, uh, what do you think possibly motivated uh, Dr. T to, to tell you these incredible things? Everybody asks <laughs> that question, and uh, I can only speculate. I, I really don't know. There was not an opportunity to ask. But I... I think there were a couple of things that were involved. One was that I think he had divided feelings about this. Uh, on the one hand, uh, repeatedly saying this is the only way, there's no other alternative, feeling that uh, somehow or another the human race would perish otherwise and that the human race should be promoted to go on. Uh, well, this this is a very common position taken by elitists. Uh, uh, Professor Quigley, who we uh, have studied very extensively, Bill Clinton's mentor, I uh, really believed that we needed a ruling elite, else Western civilization would be destroyed. And what you're really describing is a ruling elite with a program to try to uh, preserve uh, at least some element of civilization? Yes. Yes, I think that's the uh, the upfront part of it. And then in the intervening years, it has often occurred to me that what also seems to underline this uh, is a more long-range look. Um, you know, they talk about progress of the human race, uh, or progressing, and one should stop and say, well, progressing toward what? Right. And especially when you hear somebody say, we believe now that we have the means to accelerate and control evolution evolution toward what? Well, I think one possibility, I, I don't know that I've heard anybody state this explicitly, is that uh, we will progress toward becoming gods. <laughs> now, uh, that sounds a little bizarre, but uh, when you go back to read Genesis and the uh, Adam and Eve took from the tree of knowledge, and the serpent said, Ye shall be as gods. In other words, what you're suggesting is what energizes these people is a spiritual force. Uh, the idea that the serpent's message that ye shall be as gods, if, if you go along uh, with my program. Mm -hmm. You can evolve to a higher plane. And as incredible as it may seem, I, I read many, many publications by people, uh, these are occultic and Luciferian publications, uh, where this is the basic underlying theme, uh, where mankind will supplant God and bring utopia to the world. Well, uh, While I'm thinking about the book of Genesis, when, when you go to the end of that chapter, uh, and when God expelled Adam and Eve, and he said they, they got to the tree of knowledge, a uh, verse or two later, he sets a cherubim in guard of the tree of life. <laughs> and uh, I think about that, you know, we get all this uh, sperm banks and uh, uh, cloning of animals and talking about uh, cross species uh, uh, fertilization. I, I often think about that, you know, babies without sex and sex without babies. And early in the big, very early in the game, God set up a chair. He said, they go to the tree of knowledge. I'm going to keep them away from the tree of life. Just for fun, go to Genesis and read that and, and see whether you find 
any application to what's uh, going on today. Well, I, I think that this this is all prophetic. I mean, we see these things unfolding, and, and for people who don't under, know the Lord or uh, know the Bible, uh, these things seem impossible. Uh, for those of us, and I, I know you're a believer, uh, who see these things unfolding, we see uh, God's hand, and we also see the, the hand of, the, uh, of Lucifer in, in this whole incredible story. Well, are there any other points you'd like to bring out for our listeners? Well, we were talking earlier about... Um uh, unisex stuff, or at least I think we alluded to it, uh, um, the masculinization of women, girls. And uh, I don't know whether you've noticed in your area, but in our area, uh, in the last few years, the sports pages are full of girls' sports. Uh, girls' basketball, you know, and uh, as if... Is uh, that true out your way? Oh, yeah, sure. And we have uh, girls' basketball teams here. They're, uh, you know, uh, Olympic uh, girls' basketball teams, girls' volleyball teams, all of these things, uh, you know, where they're so competitive with men. Mm-hmm. Is soccer a big thing out there? Uh, no, we don't have soccer out here, to my knowledge. That'll probably become... <laughs> uh, Women's soccer you're speaking of. Well, no... Women's and men. Oh, okay, bye. Okay. <laughs> Probably someday co-educational soccer. Right. I don't know. But uh, the reason for this is that uh, we can't have girls in lacy dresses smelling perfumey and attracting the men. You mean if they're sweaty, they're not going to be as attractive? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> incredible, incredible. Did, did he actually talk about things of this sort? Oh, yeah. That, that was uh, very explicit. Uh, uh, Girls would uh, would be made less attractive because they would be, just as you said, sweaty. Right. Full of, uh, you know, sports and just like another guy. Right. And big uh, muscles and uh, all those things. Uh, so that was the one of the early parts of uh, masculinizing women. And then, of course, another part that I don't think he put in these terms, but I interpret in these terms, then, is... Uh, a woman is a good woman to the extent that she uh, mimics a man, and that is leaving her home and you know going out into the workforce and becoming CEO or office manager, some big outfit, rather than staying home taking care of children. Um, but along with, with the uh, de-feminizing of girls in the professional magazines that I get where drug products are advertised. There's uh, one that shows all these girls in their soccer uniforms, uh, mud all over them, their hair's all wet and stringy. <laughs> and this is held out to the young girls as, you know, this is what you ought to be. This is what a, uh, a young girl is. She's a muddy soccer player. Right, of course. Uh, you know, we can do anything the boys can do, and we can do it better. And the competition between women and men, <clears throat> without realizing that we all have a place and a part to play in, in God's plan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, Dr. Dennigan, it's been a, a fascinating, fascinating hour, and we'll be playing this this afternoon and several times uh, on our various radio programs. I want to thank you so very, very much for taking time from your, your busy schedule to uh, be here on Radio Liberty, because I think uh, your message, uh, going along with many of the other messages that we have, uh, begins to tie this together, uh, and I hope our listeners will be uh, far wiser from having uh, heard uh, your memories from uh, the lecture by Dr. Day, 1969, 28 years ago. Well, it's been a, a pleasure to be on, and uh, I, I hope it's helpful to folks. I hope it will be too. May God bless you, and I hope maybe at some time in the future we can talk to you again. Well, I would like that. Bye-bye. Th thanks so much. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye. Okay, well, this is Dr. Stan, an amazing, amazing take, tape uh, with a gentleman who uh, I believe uh, God uh, has preserved him to tell us the story. And I hope that you've enjoyed this program as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. And so until next time, Dr. Stan, goodbye, and may the Lord be with you. Thank you.